Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filster make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Join Primary Arms Government on September 10th for their third annual First Responder Range Day, hosted in Pasadena, Texas. This event connects law enforcement professionals with leading industry brands, all while enjoying local food and event activities. In addition to live fire demos, this year's event will feature axe throwing, archery challenges, t-shirt printing, product raffles, and more. If you're an active law enforcement professional or other first responder, RSVP today by visiting primaryarms.com government. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry. Renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have rely on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. Hey everyone, Matt Lanter here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. This episode is 309. It is the knife episode, long overdue. Knives are something we use on a daily basis. Uh, we use it to cut food. We use it to open our Amazon boxes. We, they're handy. When it comes to survival, when it comes to duty, when it comes to defensive, when it comes to all this other specialty kind of stuff, there may be a lot of misconceptions. There may be features. There may be, oh, materials, grinds, and all this kind of other stuff that people don't necessarily understand. And they might blindly go and purchase something that might not fit exactly what their mission is or what they want to do. So we're going to talk about some of that. Today is August 17th, 2022. I have an awesome panel for this. The best part of this panel also, just like some of the recent ones, is I get to sit back, I get to learn, and I get to, I, I, I get to absorb information. This is live. This is live both on Zoom and it's also live on YouTube. YouTube has a five or 10 second delay. So if you have questions or comments, we might not get it immediately. Uh, don't worry though. If you go to our, if you go to the primary and secondary LLC page on Facebook, I have a link to the Zoom, to uh, the active Zoom link, I guess. Uh, you can log in there and post your questions there so we can keep a good track of ongoing questions. At the end, I hope to answer questions uh, if they're not addressed throughout the show. We do have a specific list of content we're going to talk about. We're going to be talking about design. We're going to be talking about materials. We're going to be talking about some misunderstood content concepts. We're going to talk about snake oil. And lastly, at least according to this, we'll be talking a little bit about multi-tools because they are helpful. And it's nice to have a better idea of what to get based on, again, what your mission is. So my background's in law enforcement. I carry knives every day, on duty, defensively. I always have a pocket knife on me to open those Amazon boxes or whatever. Yeah, typically it is opening boxes uh, from Amazon, opening uh, uh, my kids' uh, food, my almost two-year-old and whatever his snack is, use the knife. Don't hand it to him yet. He's not quite there yet, but they're handy to have. Um, I've never made any, I have several, but the extent of my knowledge with it is, okay, most of them are metal and most of them either are fixed or they fold and that's all. Those are so, called, pre, those are called pre-broken knives. Okay. There you go. See, you, you just learn something new every day. So I'm going to hand this over to Shane to continue to give a, a, a background and uh, then we'll go over to LT and uh, start it up. So Shane. Uh, Shane Adams. I am uh 
kind of the utility player for SC Knives and Reynolds Adventure and Training. Um, <clears throat> my official title is marketing director. Um, last year, I spent 170 plus days in the field. Uh, almost every one of those days was with Patrick Rollins and uh, Jeff Randall, um, along with many others, our students. And that's basically doing, that's teaching, that's doing search and rescue, uh, actual live missions. That's our classes that we teach, classes that we take. Uh, and that's not counting what I do for fun uh, when I'm home, which sometimes is mostly really just mow and try to keep my yard up uh, because I'm gone all the time. But that's it for me. Uh, I'm stoked. Uh, I'm very, I want to say real quick that I'm, I'm tickled that LT is here. He's one of my favorite people in the industry. He and his crew and our crew are uh, just simpatico uh, in, in just about every arena. So I'm stoked that he is here. Uh, and I'll turn it over to LT for his introduction. Awesome. Well, first, thank you for asking me to be here, guys. This is this is really cool. I like doing the podcast. It's a lot of fun. And I love your backdrop. I mean, I can do not like that, right? <laughs> that is very, very cool. Uh, I'm LT Wright. I own LT Wright Knives. I've been making knives since about 2000, 2001 in that area. So quite a long time. Been in business for a number of years. Uh, I have been blessed with a great that I get to work with every day. We're a crew of about 10 people and we do make all the knives. You will find me in the shop seven out of eight hours or eight out of nine hours a day behind a grinder. That is what I like to do. Yes, you have to run a business, but I really like to get my hands on knives. And my biggest part in the knife making, what I really like to do is try to better my processes and get each, each movement Efficiency, I love to see how efficient I can be at doing those things. So I've been blessed to be able to wake up every single morning. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, I truly wake up. I put my feet on the floor and I put a smile on my face because I get to make knives every day. I'm a blessed man and I do not take that for granted. So thank you very much for having me here, man. I'm looking forward awesome. to a great time. Well, you know, and it just makes sense, especially in the position you're in. You have a staff of 10, you said? Yeah. It just makes sense to try to maximize that efficiency because time is ultimately money and what a cool, and, and it's such a fun project to try to figure out that, that efficiency. Yeah. We, we have developed over the years, you know, when I started out, I, I started under the front porch of my house. I have an eight foot front porch and my shot and the, and the porch is cut in half. It's eight foot by I think 32 and it's cut in half so I could reach from each side of my wall with my hands almost and touch the walls when I started. I could stand in one place and move machine and just turn in a circle, hit my machines. So when I started full time, I started under the front porch of my home. And that's where I started out and, and been blessed ever since. And we've been going strong, man. It's been a great ride. Is there a specific knife that has been the most popular or that's a signature for you specifically? Absolutely. Our Genesis is our flagship knife. Uh, that realistically came out of a lot of years of listening to emails, customers at shows. And when it got time to develop that knife and, and, and you know, you sit down and go, OK, what is that one knife that I want to make? So when we um, came out with the Genesis, that was the knife. Uh, it had everything that I wanted to put in a knife as simple as possible. And it has been our flagship ever since it is the the knife um the best-selling one that we have yeah and so what would you say its purpose would be what, or what purposes does it fill uh the genesis definitely is a bushcraft knife matter of fact i have my personal one here if you don't mind I'll... so this is my genesis this is one of the very first ones we ever made i still carry it today you can see it's got a little ding here and there um but this is a scandy grind and this one is one that I carry with me all the time in the woods. Matter of fact, even every day at work, it's in my backpack. This knife goes literally everywhere with me. Uh, when I get to the woods, I put it on my hip. Other than that, it, it kind of travels everywhere. It's got a roughly about a four inch blade. Well, there it is. He's got the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so we got the thumb scallops on there. Um, it is just an absolute, it's the broomstick style handle, which is very comfortable in multiple grips. So that, that makes it real easy. The thumb scallops are a great addition for pinch points when you want to get up close on something. So it allows you to have those as well. Uh, and then we also have what we call the sharpened spine or the 90 degree spine. 
And honestly, years and years ago, this came about on some forums, some places, because guys wanted a way to strike the prayer rods and they, somebody, and I, I wish I could give the guy credit because I honestly can't remember who it was. I remember either getting an email or, or in the forum chat, said, wow, if we could just square off the spines and eyes instead of round them over, there you go. <laughs> you, can, you can strike a pharaoh rod with them. So it was like, you know, the light bulb went off. We started doing that and it has been a staple ever since. It is something that our company is known for is our squared spines and we're very proud of them. One of the reasons why I want to specifically talk about stuff like Scandi is because I didn't learn about Scandi until I dealt with or worked with, became friends with uh, the guys over at Verstaleka in Finland. And they have a lot of knives and primarily most of their, their, uh, the production knives from their company are Scandi. And so we had a really cool discussion about them and I had no idea that there was a difference in what, what these things, what these different edges could do. And so I'm really looking forward to hear your guys' input on that. But before we get there, let's talk about overall designs and let's talk about uh, shapes, grinds, edges, all that kind of stuff. Actually, I do need to say, as you guys are listening to this, if, the, if you're finding this to be beneficial, make sure you're supporting the sources that you have found to be beneficial. Um, if you like what these guys to have, have to say, find them on social media. Pretty much everyone's on Instagram. They're probably on Twitter. They might be on YouTube, They're probably on Facebook. Find them there. Give them likes. Give them shares. Subscribe. Um, if they're providing some information that really is helpful for you, if you find a video of theirs later on that's, that you find it, it, it opened your eyes to some concepts that you didn't understand before, please share those because there is this big, stupid, um, what is it called? It is the algorithm. And the algorithm doesn't always work in favor of the good guys or the good information. And good doesn't necessarily mean popular. So make sure you're supporting those good sources of information. So let's get into that, the discussion of overall design. And that includes those shapes, those grinds, those edges, all that kind of stuff. Shane? So uh, what I tend to do uh, is if someone comes to me and says, I need a knife, um, that is always, I'm going to respond to them. Or they ask me, what's your best knife or what's your favorite knife? Or, you know, I need a knife. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to ask them is, what are you planning on doing? You know, is it an EDC knife? Is it, do you want, I mean, do you want a neck knife that you can wear? Do you want, how, 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 how is it going to be used traditionally or predominantly? Um, if all I have is a Swiss army knife on me, then that's, that's going to become my survival knife. If I wind up in a survival situation, uh, it probably makes for a force multiplier. If I strike somebody in the dome with it, although I'm not going to have time to uh, deploy it, it still makes for a hard impact. Um, so I, I guess that's one of the first things that, that we need to kind of set forward as, as far as what are we doing? What's your intended purpose? I always ask people, how do you see yourself? Cause I mean, I'm a visual thinker, so, or, or I'm a very visual guy. So, uh, I'm always thinking in pictures, like, how do you see yourself using this? Like what's, where are you going to go from there? So I, I think that's one thing, um, that people, that's a good way to qualify a person, but then also within our industry, and, and I'm sure LT can speak to this too, is we have a survival knife and we have a bushcraft knife and we have like all these different categories of this. But really, if I'm being very, very truthful, I can do almost everything I need with a knife. And this is not a big knife. Uh, so I still go back to skill trumps uh, gear any day. And so getting, once again, as, as we talked about in the last podcast, is getting the most out of whatever tool it is you have on you. Um, that requires practice. It requires some time uh, in the dirt. Uh, and it, require, it re requires you to, to invest in learning. You know, this is one of my favorite little pocket folders. It's a really inexpensive open nail folder. And you can see all the rust that's on the, I mean, it's, it's carbon steel. It's been rusted and all kinds of stuff, but it's smooth as glass because I've used it, stropped it, whatever else, but it handles 99% of my cutting tasks. So um, all knives have, or, or most of us have design intentions on a knife, but, but certainly working within those parameters, uh, 
you can use just about any knife for anything. It's just, you got to know its strengths and weaknesses. Well, I know for a fact that you guys as, as the knife people are facing the same thing as the gun people where someone who might not be overly well-versed in guns or knives might have a concept or an idea in their head. Well, I need this. I need, I need this gun right here or this gun right here. It has the red dot, the optic, the, or the, the optic, the, the light, this, that super high capacity. And I'm going to save the hostages. Now, is that realistic for what are you, is that actually part of your mission? I can only imagine the things you guys face with on the knife end. Because for a realistic thing for me was, well, I, I want to have uh, like an outdoors type knife. Probably a three inch blade is going to be plenty. But more importantly, before I even think about that, I probably have to have a skill set to use that. Otherwise, it's just going to be on my belt looking pretty, but that's about it. Absolutely. And I agree with Shane completely on when someone comes to you and asks you, what's the best knife for me? Well, the first thing you have to ask them, and I do the same as he does, what do you, what's your intention? What do you plan on using the knife for? And then if they say, well, I'm going to do a lot of these things, then I narrow it down and say, okay, so what do you want it mainly to do? What do you want it to do really, really good? Let's start there because that's going to differentiate the size and the grind of the, your knife right there. Am I going to just field dress game and cut my sandwich and peel my apple at camp? Okay, you, I lean you one direction. Am I going to make all of my tools at camp, my pot hooks, my tent stakes? You know, then I may lean you in another direction. But as Shane said too, you can make just about anything of these any any type grind or steel or length or size work if you use your skill set. And that's the biggest thing that I've seen change in the industry since I've been in, in as a knife maker. When we first started making bushcraft style knives, it was three thirty seconds thick, big monster knives. Now we're down to one eighth inch, four inch blade, three inch blade. And the reason being, the sole reason is the industry has got better educated on how to use mm -hmm. the tool. They're not just bludgeoning their way through things they're now actually got the skill set because there's just like Essie, there's so many training schools out there that you can go to and get legit stuff, which is fantastic. So that is the big change that I've seen coming across is the size of knives are getting a little bit smaller. Now we still have our choppers, but the skill sets getting up here and the knife sizes may be coming down here a bit. Matt, what we generally see in our classes is um, our advanced bushcraft class is one of our more popular classes. And our, our first time students, we see a lot of people come back to that class. And a lot of times people will show up with one of our SE5s, which is just a massive chunk of stick. I mean, it's a doorstop and a boat anchor. Um, better than anything. And they start trying to take this huge, massive design. Uh, or this massive blade and they start trying to do really fine tasks with it. And what we see over time is when those people first show up as the skill level goes up, the knives generally get smaller and thinner in almost every instance, whenever they're doing those camp tasks, the, the woodcraft, the bushcraft, the bush crafty kind of stuff that we talk about that LT was just referencing there too. Are you going to make your, your pot hooks, are you going to carve spoons? Are you going to carve spatulas, ladles, all that stuff? Uh, generally, if you're going to do that, I would much rather have a small thin knife because it cuts better and is, is a safer uh, application uh, than using a large bulky knife that just doesn't has the same cutting geometry. Well, that reminds me of, uh, I think when we were discussing this, there was a specific brand I thought would be interesting to touch upon, uh, Swedish Mora. More knife. I think that would be an interesting uh, uh, brand to talk about because it seems it doesn't have the, the the appearance or the look that people usually think of when, well, I need, I need this Rambo knife. Do you? Is this Moro knife going to be a little better suited for the tasks you're actually going to do? LT? Well, I think more is for the price. My gosh, what a knife. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I encourage people, if you're going to start going, if you want to get into bushcraft, you want your kid to get into bushcraft, absolutely get a more knife. You should have one. Everyone should have one. They're great little knives. They're fantastic. 
So yeah, yeah, I am a fan of the Moore Knife. It is a great place to start. There is no doubt about it. And so, uh, oh, I was just going to say for uh, for people that aren't familiar with it, when you see it, you'll think it's a steak knife. It's this thin, small. But do you need more than that? Uh, I've I've sold almost as many Moore knives as I, as I have uh, LT Wright knives. Um, uh, not to mention SE knives, but uh, I, it's it's their their price point. I think Mora's, if you were to go to Amazon or your favorite knife company right now and, and look up a Mora, you could probably buy a Mora and have it to your house delivered in a couple of days for under 25 bucks. Um, they have a carbon steel option. They have, um, I can't remember what their stainless steel options are, but uh, they're not they're not like the high-end super steels, but you don't really need them. Um, me personally, I like to push people, especially for a first knife or early knife, to get a carbon steel knife because carbon steel is very forgiving and it allows you to learn to sharpen. I can't tell you how many people have gone out and spent tons of money on a knife and they can't maintain it. They can't sharpen it. Um, and it's one of the, one of the things we can talk about later in steels is uh, edge retention versus uh, field serviceable and how that relates to super steel. Adding that to the list. So overall, with some of the misconceptions are the, the grinds and the shapes. It, to the best of your guys' knowledge, just off the top of your head, if you can think of some of the more common ones, like Tanto, for example. I know on the tactical side, that was super popular. And one of the reasons why it has a thicker tip that won't chip or that won't break off. I don't know if there are any other benefits to it. Um, that's where you guys come in. But can you think of some, some common edges and, and shapes and what they're – as Scandi – also what their purposes are and where, where they really shine and what tasks. So Matt, what might be better for us to list is to talk about like, like LT, uh, his Genesis here, LT, do you call that a spear point? Is that what yours is? Yeah. Or? Yeah, that's okay. A spear point. Okay. So we're, and what we're talking about here is not grinds. So what we're talking about is the outline and the blade shape. Um, SE is generally known for what we call as a drop point. So you see that on a spear point, this point is kind of more towards the midline of the knife versus a drop point, which kind of hangs up here on the spine. And then the point just kind of drops off the top of the spine. Uh, personally, uh, LT uh, probably has a lot more experience with these. I don't have a huge preference one versus the other. We have a few spear points in our line, like the laser strike. Okay. Um, and the laser strike is one of my personal favorites uh, for a lot of different reasons uh, we can talk about later. But uh, I guess as a personal preference, I actually kind of favor a spear point just because of the relationship to the point to the midline. But LT, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, a spear point is very popular. There's a, a lot of reasoning, I guess, behind that. One is it does put the point, as Shane said, in, in the middle of the knife. So if you're drilling, for instance, that is going to drill from exactly here. So if you had, let's say, a straight back knife, your point's going to be here. You're going to cant your drill a little bit, and it's going to be. So you're, you're getting more center control all the way around a knife for such a thing. Uh, drop point, you're probably going to end up with a little more belly at most times, exactly, a lot more belly than you would on the spear point, as you can see here. So if you're field dressing game, you're gonna have a nice sweep up there at the beginning, or even feather sticking with the end of that knife would be really, really good. You got a lot going on there. So uh, again, it can be a personal preference in a sense. Um, this is a straight blade here, and then it has a slight belly and coming to a spear point. This is also a very strong tip. Because as you can see on the Scandi, look how much meat is above the actual grind line. Okay, so it's back in this, where if this point was here at the top, it's a different kind of, it's still backed up, but it's different if you can visualize that in your head. So you're, you're getting a very strong tip. The center tip, again, aids in, um, I just guess, I guess, balancing the knife for certain tasks as you're drilling and stuff. So that, that would be uh, my biggest thing on that is, Spear points are very strong. Um, they're also forgiving. 
because they are centered in the knife. You're not searching for it in a sense. Shane, do you have any other examples of other types to go over? Uh, this is one of, this is another spear point. Uh, so what we can talk about real quick while we're here, maybe somebody was talking about a, a PR4. This is the second PR4 prototype that James Gibson ever made. I was fortunate enough to actually grab that before I was on staff. Um, so you ask about a, cert, a few certain features in blades and we can get to a few of those. Um, so one thing that you'll see on some knives, especially more tactical knives, is so we have something that's a little closer to a spear point here, kind of a modified drop point. But up here on top, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, there you go. So this is called a, a clip point, or it's got a sharpened swedge. I, would you call that a swedge, LT? Yep. yep. Okay. And it's sharpened, so it's not false. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is actually sharpened. Some are. Um, you can kind of see. There's a, a, another bevel right here that's not sharpened. Um, maybe a more uh, exact, that's on the SEC M6. Uh, on a more exaggerated knife is, this is a custom knife made by uh, J.W. Uh, Bersinger, I think. Uh, he's up your way somewhere, LT. Guy makes a really cool. Um, oh, I like that. Yeah. Well, okay. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So, so you can get what this thing is for. So someone with a clip point or a sharpened swedge, you're looking for something that's going to be, uh, this really has one primary purpose and that's to be a sewing machine. So it's extra stabby when you have the, uh, uh, when you have that sharpened swedge, uh, sometimes they're faults. Uh, in this case, this one is actually a false swedge because there's not an actual edge on that. So you've got a clip point with a sharpened swedge, and then also you've got a false one, but it's made uh, to go in a little easier. Uh, we did make uh, some SE threes and fours for the Secret Service uh, years back with a sharpened uh, with a, in a clip point, um, and we sold those for a couple of years. And we recently discontinued them. So I, LT, do you have any of the defensive style knives with anything like that? I don't have anything here, no. I but don't. do you? You don't have a. You don't really have a model in the lineup that you're well, doing right. Uh, I we make one. I make a bevel. I make one every Christmas and sell it through our pout house. Yeah, uh, it's one of my fighters that I made years and years ago. Matter of fact, it was the first knife I ever had pictured in Tactical Knives magazine. First knife I ever had made a magazine was this fighter, and then I've been making them onesie twosies ever since. But it also has the false clip, just like what you were talking. Could you hold that up again, Shane, for a second? Uh, the 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 custom. Yeah, the custom. Where did I put it? Yeah, I'm, I'm in things. a I'm in a sea of knives here. So. Yeah, that one, uh, Matt. One of the things you can notice on this is because that material has been taken away. What he mentioned about the point being extra sharp, but if you looked at that knife point on, it would be almost diamond shaped, and it would get bigger in all directions as it goes in accelerating the whole size of the wound, okay? And yeah. because of it having the material taken away from the very tip, the access of entry would be a little bit easier than forcing like a, you know, a blunt candy grind in or something. And you can see yeah. how it would just increase on its way in as it's going down in that diamond shape. You uh, they're, they're that very cool looking knives. It's also a balance thing as far, you know, how far back the swedge goes to how you want it to feel in your hand. So sometimes if you're making, quote, a fighting knife, you may balance it a little bit using that. Oh, and he's even tapered tang, yeah. So he, he's got a distal taper in the tang. And basically what that means is in a lot of tangs, and a tang is, is, so these are full tang knives. That means the metal runs all the way through. This is a, a constant quarter inch thick chuck of steel right here. So a lot of times companies will drill holes in the tang to kind of help balance out the knife. So it's not tip heavy or, or tail heavy. Um, so this knife, and this is something you generally see. Um, I'm trying to get it to where you can see. So if you look how thick it is here, you can see it gets thinner. And so because we remove, remove material up here, we want this knife to balance pretty close to midline. 
uh, and it would probably do be real close to that. So the, so the knife has got a spine on it that's sturdy, so you don't necessarily break a point really easy. Uh, even if I broke, even if I broke half to three quarters of an inch off this tip, uh, you still have a, a tool here, or a weapon potentially uh, that you can still go to work with because of that shape. But it's also got plenty of backbone on that distal taper, uh, and it's light in the hand, so it maneuvers easy. Like uh, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do my best Doug Markaita uh, thing, but uh, but that yeah, that knife will kill. It, it, in the in the right hands, it will. And, and balance is definitely an important thing. If, if let's say if that was a fighting knife, you would want it balanced a certain way for you to have that quick tip, as Shane mentioned. Now. Balance can be different on a working knife, and, I, and I'll explain how, because I've had people come up to, to me and say, you know, they grabbed one of our knives and they'll do this and it's, it's handle heavy. And it is handle heavy, and this is the reason why, this is a working knife. So if I'm gonna work with this knife for quite a long time, I don't wanna have to squeeze that knife to keep it in my hand. So I wanna be able to just let it stay there and then use it as a controlling feature. Now, when I say it's handle heavy, that does not mean it's hugely heavy in the handle. It's just a little bit handle heavy on that. And our working knives, most, and again, it does depend on the length of the blade. So this is our four and a half inch, you know, and it just sets right nice in the hand. So if I'm working, uh, you know, field dressing an elk or something, you don't want to have to struggle holding on to your knife because your blade's out there and it's so long and it's heavy. Um, you know, well, you've been a gun guy, you know, the guy who, gets his concealed carry and goes out and buys a Smith and Wesson 10 inch barrel and he carries it for half a day. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, great, it's a great gun, but it's just too heavy. So kind of same thing with the knife. You know, if I can make this knife as comfortable in my hand for using it for whatever task that I'm doing, that's going to make me forget about the knife. Uh, you know, it's just going to be a pleasant tool to use all the time. Friend of the network, Jack Lewis, brought up a good question, which also reminds me my dad, who's watching, had a question as well, or brought up a knife as well. Um, daggers, being ambidextrous, um, are, they, are they more of a probe than a slash in, in your guys' experience with their overall design? And then how does that also relate to the, was it the Fair, what is it, Fairbairn and Sykes? Fairbairn Sykes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, uh, for me, a dagger is uh, often you hear them called push daggers. Uh, they are ambidextrous. Many of these knives you can be, can be used in an ambidextrous way. Uh, the Fairborn Sykes um, is kind of the classic dagger design that you saw. I think Applegate is another is is another one. Um, uh, and then Microtech actually has like this fluted spike that's really gnarly. Uh, I've seen that. Uh, so you also see a lot of other, um, I think County com and you see a lot of other folks that are making these, these, uh, chopsticks that are more about to me. And, and so that's a modified dagger in a sense. Um, so I think, uh, LT may have another take on that as well, though. Uh, daggers naturally, they've been around for a, a long time. Uh, a lot of them aren't even sharpened. They just have a point. So that is one of those type things. Uh, I've seen daggers sharpened just on one side, both sides. And then, as I said, just as a point, not really have a sharpened edge, just a you know down to zero edge kind of thing. Uh, I'm not super knowledgeable about daggers, so I can't give you a whole lot of information. Do I like them? Yeah, I think they're really cool. Um, I, I've had uh, an Eck that is a dagger style knife, a, a couple of those in my lifetime. So I do like them. I don't have a lot of information to add. Sorry about that one, guys. <laughs> Same here, a little bit out of our wheelhouse. So we've caught, we talked a little bit about shapes. Are there other shapes you guys can think of that we can cover or should we go to grinds and that kind of stuff? Well, shapes, there, I mean, there are tons and tons of shapes. There, there's no doubt it's, it's almost, Anything you can think of, uh, you can turn into a blade shape. If it, uh, not, yeah, basically. That helm Persian. There you go. Uh, you know, it's it, all all a knife is is a point, a, an edge, and a handle, basically. So yeah, you can do a lot of different things with it. Um, 
Go ahead. I was going to say the shapes go back to what do you plan to do? So even, even within like a fighting knife category, you've got, you know, a knife that's, that's closer to this uh, versus a clinch pick, which has a very specific application in how it's used. Um, and, and, and so I remember talking to, to somebody that uh, I can't remember who, uh, I can't remember who designed this, but I was having a conversation. They, Craig they, Douglas. Craig Douglas, and he was talking. I know a South Nart guy, and I think somebody else actually designed one too, maybe even before him, but I could be wrong on that. But uh, he thought about a tiger claw and how, and, and that's pretty much the the repetitive use of, of the clinch pick. So the application, like the knife, the Persian that you're showing, is going to be way more of a, a fit into a school of thought that is much more of a, a slashing motion versus someone who may, you know, who may be more along the lines of like a, a Libre system who they, they run knives like sewing machines, you know? And so either one's going to let the air out of you. That's for sure. Uh, but finding that knife, that's going to be right for that application. So whether it's bushcraft or even within a defensive knife, you still have like this very broad spectrum of shape, of design, of intent uh, that really needs to be looked at. Good stuff. Now, uh, again, going with the shapes, um, was there another question about the tactical side, though, before we move kind of away from the dagger? I thought maybe there was one more. I think that might have been it. Okay. Because, again, shapes um, moving into like, your standard using knives, the drop points and stuff. This is um, one of our standard drop points. This is actually my steak knife. This is, um, I mean, we, my wife and I have one of these and it is what we call our small powder, which is a great field dressing game knife. It, it's great for a lot of stuff. Um, and this is a drop point with a full flat grind. So you can see that the point is high on this and it has a little bit of a belly and then a, a nice straight section and a generous handle. So the shape of this knife again, lends itself to field dressing game, or as I said, cutting up steak. It's just, it's really good for that size. This is one of my favorite knives in the whole world. And it's a modified knife that I made for our kitchen. And this is my watermelon knife. I literally, this is the knife and we eat a lot of water. I love watermelon. And I put this in there and I just spend very that, little time cutting with this knife. That is it so is cool. Fantastic watermelon knife and with so, a lot of green can handles on it this i mean this is a uh, it just works so well it just works I, so well in, in doing it it's lt i love the arc of that yeah. that uh, what a lot of people don't understand is looking at that knife and seeing that kind of arc the way that adds in cutting efficiency and you've got a little bit more of a belly on there too okay. uh that's a that makes for a, a knife that's very controllable that's very efficient uh, and, and it feels quite good. And I mean, I, I would be, and also I saw how thin that knife was. So yeah. I know that that thing's a cutter. Yeah, this, this is, and it's a full flat, about two inches full flat. The angle on this is literally three degrees, maybe two degrees. Oh, wow. It, yeah. is, it is a slicer. And when you touch, I'm, I hit the rind on that watermelon. It's like straight down through full and you're done. It's fantastic. Yeah. And the coolest part is this is just a modified modification of one of our, our camp kitchen knife. It was just a modification that we had laying in the shop and I made it, brought it home, fell in love with it. So I use this thing all the time. So shape, again, this was never an intended shape. This was a, I messed up a knife and I had to change the look of it. Basically is truthfully what happened, brought it home and it turned into my favorite knife in the whole house. So. That mess is up, awesome. Mess up another one for me. That's right. Are, are you familiar with uh, Jake Hoback? Hoback knives? Yeah. yeah I, I, notice, I notice with his, the overall shape seems like the knife, the, the edge, everything seems to be going back. It's almost, I can't even think of it. What would you call that? Um, so as opposed to a knife being straight up and down, the blades almost goes backwards like a, you're talking at, at the about spine like toward, of it towards a Persian, like an upsweep. I might have to go grab mine really quick and show you. 
because yeah. I, I'd be interested in finding out, okay, what would be the logic behind or what, what's the benefit of this? So before you do that, can we mark something off our list and just go ahead and have the serration discussion? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Did you yeah. say mark them off the list or grind them off? I was. <laughs> it sounds like the same. <laughs> so, so I'll go first. Um, I hate serrations. Um, they're hard to sharpen. Uh, if I worked in a situation in a marine environment or someplace where I was cutting rope a lot, it certainly has application. Outside of that, I, I, I'm just not a fan. I prefer a plain edge uh, a thousand times over. Um, I do anything with even partially ser Here's what I hate about. Here's a perfect example of a partially serrated blade. And here's, here's what I really hate about this blade that's partially serrated is that the serrations to me, this real estate right here, that's close to your hand is your highest leverage, most controlled, uh, real estate. It's, it's where I need, um, my cutting power and my, my, um, uh, ability to be exacting in that. Um, and with the serrations there, uh, I am just not a fan of that. So if this were truly my knife, I'd grind those suckers off. Now, everybody feels like they got to have them or they want them, so we sell them some. But it, I, I don't, there's not a single person in our company that was like, yeah, serrations are cool. We all hate them, but people want them, so we give them to them. But well, uh, As you said, they're on the sweet spot of that knife. They, yeah. they are. And every, every blade that you see that's partially – I've never seen one that's – you know, partially serrated out towards the end. It's all right here. Well, the Rambo knives had it on the spine. No, oh, well, that's a different story. <laughs> we'll talk about that in the snake oil side of things. Oh, the sawbacks. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So I'm going to share a picture really quick. Okay. It's easier than me running and getting the, uh, the knife. Let's see here. So this guy, so there's just a very, very, very slight angle going backwards, if you can see it. Uh, across the top, basically? Yes. Yeah. So I, and I have one of his folders and I, I, I like it very much. It's, it's for what it is. It's fairly light. Uh, very smooth action. And I, but this is, this is a fixed blade that I showed you though, but I did notice the, the slightly unusual angle with uh, the blade is in reference to how my hand is. And I found that I always found that to be interesting and I never reached out and asked. So why is your blade slightly backwards or leaning backwards slightly? I wonder if it has something to do with maybe leverage on really cutting something, but I'm not sure. Just wondering if you guys have any experience with that kind of design. I'm not knowing the knife, yeah. Uh, not knowing the maker, which I'd, I'd like to get to know the guy. It's a kind of cool knife. I like the the Tonto look, the the double grind. Some Tontos just have like a single grind. He did a real nice job. Uh, if I was just going to speculate, and please everyone that's listening understand, I'm just yeah. speculating. Yeah. If you use that knife in a reverse grip, now you have the way that knife was shaped. Now you have a slight bit of a hook. So yep. if you're a fighter that fights reverse grip, it allows you to slash and hook without uh, a lot of work. So that could be one of the reasons that is in the shape that you're saying could be for a reverse grip fighter to be used as, as the hooking portion of the tool, right? Yeah. So, it's, so this is what I would call a modified Persian. And I think what he was doing, so a lot of times when you see, and, and like what, uh, what LT was saying, generally you're talking about a slash in motion with a lot of these. So a lot of this stuff, wavy stuff going on with, uh, with those blades. This is a, this is a folder that I was doing some, uh, some T and E for, for a company called Kunwu. That's a, a really, actually a really nice folder for pretty inexpensive price. Um, but they have that kind of that upswept Persian style blade. Mm -hmm. And just like you guys said before, yeah, there's so many different shapes, sizes, flavors, colors, and to figure out, okay, what's your mission? Let's start there and then branch off. 
we could, we could be here all day. This could be a 10 hour episode. <clears throat> um, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Knife shape. It does boil down to the biggest thing is what am I going to use it for mainly? Okay. And if people would just, everyone wants the one knife that can do everything. Okay. I have, I mean, I've tried to make that knife. I, I truly have. I mean, that's what we all are after, right? The one gun that does every task that you can have. You got it on the wall right behind you, that one gun. So there it is. Um, one of the things when I go to talk to someone about a knife, and it always goes, what is your main task? Because let's fill that. And, and here is the best reference. You being a gun guy, you're going to totally see what I'm going with. Let's talk about a rifle, shotgun, and a pistol. Okay. You and I are going to go elk hunting. I'm going to give you my 12 gauge shotgun and we're going to shoot 500 yards at an elk. Is that going to be not a great day for you? You're, you're not going to enjoy that. Yeah. Unless you give me a bunch of slugs and a lot of time to train and get used to that range. Yeah. Exactly. So, so if, if I give you a buckshot, you're just not going to have a great day elk hunting with me. But is it the fault of the weapon? No, because we just chose the wrong tool for the wrong situation. Same thing with a pistol, the same thing with a rifle. I don't want to go squirrel hunting with a 30 out six because I'll bring a bag of fur every day, right? It's just, but again, is it the fault of that rifle? That rifle's a fantastic tool for elk hunting, you know, in, in, in its position. So the same thing applies when you're looking at a knife. It's like, okay, let me use that analogy. Is this knife going to do, am I going to be able to baton frozen wood with this? No. So maybe I should look for a larger knife, maybe with a Scandinavian grind, maybe at a 532nd thickness instead of an eighth, a little bit bigger. So when you start figuring out what, what the task is, your ultimate knife will appear for you. Because once you get that knife that you can do that main thing, if you, let's say you live in Alaska and you have to bust down a lot of frozen wood but get to get a fire started you're going to also learn how to do the pot hooks with that big enough because you have that knife with you you're going to learn how to change your grip you're going to be able to get your pinch grips you're going to be able to hold it here put your pinky here get your fingers out of the way and do fine work with it this way there's going to be so many things that you're going to take that larger knife to learn and and vice versa with the small knife you're going to figure out how to do larger tasks well i can't baton with this little knife and a big piece of log but maybe I can carve a wedge and then use that wedge to baton the bigger pieces into the smaller pieces and so on right down the road. So the pistol shotgun rifle, kind of like your chopper, your, your bushcraft mid range and your detail knife, kind of, kind of all fill all together for that. So three tool options, always a great thing to have. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, question just came up and I think it works perfectly with the direction we're going Excellent timing, Jason. Um, what is your guys' preference for a grind for bushcraft? And so now let's let's talk about various grinds and what they do, what they're best for, suited for. Take it away. Shane, you want to hit this one first? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, so uh, we're going to talk about grind, but I can't talk about grind without talking about blade thickness. Because um, to me what we're looking for is controllability and, and also a good cut. Um, I, uh, for bushcraft and fine task, I always prefer a thinner knife over a thicker knife 99% of the time. Uh, and by thin knife, I mean, I mean, I like one of L LT's got a few knives that are some of my favorite. This is one of his cam rats. Uh, this three thirty seconds, which is thin. It's three thirty seconds, right? LT. Right. Okay, super thin. We don't make a knife that thin. The thinnest thing we make is an eighth. Um, so if I have an eighth inch stock and a convex on one of our, like our PR4, and notice I say I convex the edge, it moves into a full flat grind. That has really good cutting efficiency that I appreciate. So I can take a thin full flat grind knife, preferably with a convex, because I like to knock the shoulders off that, that hard bevel. Um, and it has really good cutting efficiency. M most people will say Scandi. If I had to pick one for bushcraft, it's going to be a Scandi knife. Um, another one of my favorites is uh, another LT right pronghorn. You, you'll notice a theme here. 
Uh, this one is a little thicker than the three thirty seconds. I'm not LT. will know that. Those are an eight. Yeah. Yep. So that's an eight, but it's Scandi grind. But also, I, I've got one of our PR four prototypes here that is uh, an eight, but it has a really nice convex edge, which I could never show you on this camera. So there's no shoulders on that. But this thing bites wood and cuts into wood like a Scandi is wood. It would so for me. Um, it has as much to do with blade thickness and edge geometry as it does the actual edge or grind. So that's a non-answer to a question. So I'll say Scandi with an eighth inch or thin full flat grind with a convex edge. Yeah, uh, I agree as well. If, if you're saying, what do I want for bushcraft? I most likely I'm going to steer you towards a Scandi. And Matt, the, the best way to think of a Scandi is think of how, if you're going to work wood, and how a wood chisel works a piece of wood. You put that wood chisel on there and you just strip down that piece of wood. Well, that's what the advantage of that Scandinavian grind gets for you. It gets you that you lay the, the bevel down on the wood and strip it out, you know, so you're gonna, you're gonna get that with the Scandi. So I do like that. Now, uh, what he said about the actual edge is a very important thing too, okay? And it does not matter the grind, when anyone buys one of our knives, we put a convex edge on it. Or, so you have your primary grind, your secondary grind. So the edge is getting that convex. So it's going to be just a little bit. And we generally do that with, especially on our scandies, we grind these sharp off of our machines on a flat plate. And then we micro bevel is what we call it a scan, or I'm sorry, micro bevel the edge of that scan. So you're ground to zero, and then just ever so slightly on a hard felt wheel, we polish the very edge of that, taking the burr away. So you, you've sharpened knives and you've created a burr. So there is just ever so slightly a micro convex on the edge. Now, the reason that's on there, and people have asked me, can you send mine out without? And I will simply just say no. And, and this is the reason. There are some companies out there that just sharpen their Scandies to, to zero and send them out and they cut fantastic. They are absolutely fantastic cutters. We warranty our knives for life, okay? These knives, I don't know where they're gonna go. They could go to Alaska, they could go to the jungles in, in Amazon. I don't know. So we have to find that sweet spot for everyone. And we found when we first started making Scandies and we sharp and they were amazingly sharp, but because we didn't apply that micro bevel, what happened was we got micro chipping on the early versions. Okay, yeah, you can see the bevel on that one's nice and shiny. Um, so the, the micro bevel helped with the little tiny chip out and I'm, I mean microscopic chip out, you know, they weren't chunks but it would feel dull when you were cutting with it. So after we started doing that, and we've been doing that ever since, and I mean, that's a sense like year one, um, we've gotten great reputation on our edges. We've gotten great feedback. And, and the majority of the people who have the product are very pleased with it. So that is one of those things. So Scandinavian grind for bushcraft, totally agree with it. And as Shane said, don't forget to think about the thickness because if you have a Scandi grind on a 3 16 inch thick knife, that's a pig. That's a, now, not to say it's not gonna do some great work, but that's a, that's a big knife. You're gonna be working it. You know, 330 seconds, man, it's gonna be light, you know, nimble. You're gonna be able to do a lot of things with that. Uh, I found the three spot for me personally is right in the 1 8 range, right? Yeah. We're, uh, you know, right in here, I like the 1 8 stock and again, personal preference that's where we landed too uh and something that lt talked about chipping out even if you don't have chip out a lot of times on a zero scandy especially a new knife you'll have uh the edge roll where yeah. if they start to do if it doesn't chip out it might roll and you can actually see like hold that edge up to the light and you can see that edge roll glint off of that and um I use, if you noticed on every edge I'm showing you here, the edge is normally polished. I use a strop, a leather strop, a, a loaded leather strop to uh, strop my knives almost exclusively. I beat the brakes off of my knives, and yet I almost 
never have to uh, put them on a stone. Uh, I just, I strop the edges and maintain them like I do my guns. And uh, every time a knife gets used, it gets maintained before it goes back into the, into the, uh, the drawer or wherever it's stationed. And, and we go from there. So any other edges you guys want to talk about? Uh, sure. I mean, we, we pretty much talked about Scandies and I think we both like Scandies, but again, they're, uh, bushcraft and, and, and like campcraft, man, the, they just, they will excel and right hands. And again, that goes back to skill set. You know, a guy who has used nothing but hollow grinds to field dress game, you hand him a scandy, he's probably not going to have a great next hour, you know, because yeah. you gotta, you gotta get the feel for it. You gotta get up on it. Um, I think after scandy, I, I know saber is a very popular grind, but if I'm not take, if I'm not going to stick with my scandy personally, I'm going to drop to a flat grind. Okay, so I'm going to go up into something like this, and and the reason being because now my brain is thinking I want something that's slicing. I I may do you know field dressing game, getting camp food ready, cutting up all the vegetables or something. So I'm thinking more slicey in in that particular aspect. So a flat grind with that convex edge. Okay, now it's going to have where the Scandi has only a primary bevel with a, there's no, I don't really want to consider it a secondary bevel because it's literally just buff. Okay, so this has just a primary where your flat grind has your primary and let's say you have it come down to 15 thousandths at the edge and then it has that secondary bevel or the sharpening edge placed upon to, on top of that. So that's given you a, a little bit of a, a different angle going into it as well. And a full flat grind, uh, again, slicing tomatoes. If you handed me these two knives, I'm going to grab this one, you know, just, just like that. So LT, Matt, let's back up here for a second. The teacher side of me wants to hit a few things to make sure we're clear. Please. So when we talk about a full flat grind, that means this whole plane of this blade is ground in one flat motion. And then we have what we call the, the edge or, and then, and then just above that, in this case, where that powder coat stops is the secondary, it would be the, the bevel, the edge bevel, not the secondary bevel, just an edge bevel. Okay. So you've got the edge and you've got the bevel, which is this angle, the shiny angle on this particular blade. And then you've got the grind, which is full flat on this knife. All right. You got that? Nod your head. Yes. All right. So on, on a, a saber, and this is what we call a high saber grind on our, so that was an SE three. I showed you like our SE three, our SE four, uh, are all flat grind. So what you see here is once again, now this one's been convex because this is my I, I, first thing I do when I buy a new knife is take it out and screw it all up. Um, so I have a convex edge. So that bevel, is non-existent. I knocked the shoulder off that edge right there. So it cuts. Now, what makes this, this is partially, it's not a full flat grind because it moves to being complete full thickness right here. Right. So, so that's what we would call a high saber or a saber grind. Sometimes this saber line will be lower down here. Actually, I, I actually have one here that I can show you. Yeah. So you can see, can you see yep. the saber line? Yep. Yeah, that's what he's talking about right there. There's the saber line on this one. All right, here's another one. So our SE5, you see how that saber, this saber line comes down. So you've got full thickness up top, and then you've got this right here. Now, real quick, if we start talking about Scandi. So what we have here, might be better if I turn it this way. All right, so what we have right here is from this grind on this LT right pronghorn, uh, made by some buddies of mine, is they hit this grind right here, and it goes down. When we say Scandi to zero, when they turn this over and grind this other side, the edge is there and intact, and it's ground to zero. And what LT's talking about is that's where a lot of people stop. And what you wind up getting is you get this super, super thin edge that cuts like a banshee until you hit a, a knot in the wood or something. And then you'll get 
a roll or something on that edge. And what I like to tell people to do is on your thumbnail, not your thumb, you can run that edge down it and feel any irregularities in that blade. Another good way to know whether or not your blade is sharp is whenever you tap it to your thumb, does it bite the nail? Is it biting in? So if it skates across your thumbnail and you're hitting it at about a 45 degree angle, then you probably still got work to do. Um, I really think that's about all I can really talk about here as far as full flats. That's one of our Azula 2s, full flat grind. There's no no other line there to grind on. So, um, but LT, you got anything to add to that? Or did I say anything wrong there? No, everything's good to go. Uh, so, Scandies, Sabres, flats, you have full convex ground knives. Uh, big choppers are usually in that way. Kukri's, if you're familiar with the Kukri, a lot of those are in a um, full convex. And then hollow grinds. Hollow grinds, very, very popular in the 70s. Uh, fantastic, sharp grind. Buck knives. I used to collect a ton of buck knives, and, and a lot of those were hollow ground knives. I started collecting buck knives because my dad carried buck knives, and, and I like them. They're great. And that's what I learned to field dress game with was buck style knives and they were all hollow grind. And again, hollow grind with a secondary edge bevel. So that, that um, the only thing that really, well, con some convexes can go straight to zero. Some mm -hmm. guys do that and then maybe polish that edge off or, or the Scandi for just ground to zero. And then your secondaries, your flats, sabers, your hollow grinds, most most of the time have secondary edges. Yep. What's up, Matt? What next? Questions from the peanut gallery. Everybody's so I don't see any questions currently. Um, I think we're going on to materials. And so here is a Joe Watson hits knife that's titanium. It's, it's, it's light. It's a fun little stabby. I bought it years ago. It's kind of fun, but titanium is not really one of those materials I see too often with a knife. I wonder why. I, I don't have any experience with titanium other than for liners for folders, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. Uh, I can't give you any input at all on, on that particular metal. I don't think I've actually ever been asked to make a titanium knife. Um, just never went that direction. And it's definitely not something that I use. Like I don't use the edge every day. It's more of a, this is a defensive thing. So I'm not cutting my, I'm not opening up boxes from Amazon or anything like that with it. It is a nice, very lightweight, handy little blade. Nice. Everything about it. But yeah. What I know about titanium comes from the bicycle industry. Um, it's a phenomenal, uh, it's a phenomenal um, medium for bike frames and bicycle components. Uh, well, I don't know anything about it as far as how it governs or how it operates within the knife community. I know there's a few places uh, that make them, uh, but maybe they've uh, good on them because, because it's, 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 it's hell on wheels when it comes to machines and other stuff, because it is super hard and it's very hard to work with. So if they figure something out and then good on them. Yeah. So let's talk about those. Let's talk about those steels. And then after that, let's talk about materials for grips or handles. Okay. Hey, uh, before we talk about steels, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to weave some of the snake oil conversation into this. If we can, perfect, perfect, and I, and I don't think LT uh, will uh, disagree too much. Is it is my contention that uh, a lot of our industry, like the gun industry, is is really based around hype, and and about every eighteen months, somebody comes out with a new. I'm going to do this super steel uh, that's flavor of the month. That's the new hot cheerleader that everybody wants to date. Um, and so what I want, I, rather than throwing off on steels and, and the fad chasers and the other things, what I, if someone has a conversation with me and they ask solely about which steel is better than is steel a better than steel B. 
then I'm going to try to say this diplomatically. I what think you're is, going, I think you're going in the exact direction I wanted to go. What, what that normally indicates to me is that they have a, a very shallow understanding maybe of, of how deep steel is. And in specifically in relation to heat treat, because steel is steel, but when it becomes a knife, it doesn't become a knife until it's heat treated. And so you can take the same steel off the same raw, you know, uh, stick of steel and make a knife out of it. And you could heat treat them three different ways. And if you had someone use those knives, they would all three act vastly different and have vastly different properties based solely on how they're heat treat. So that if I could, if I could bust, uh, one of the major myths in our industry is that when people start, you know, throwing stones at each other uh, about this steel is better than that steel. And that, well, the, the steels are only as good as the heat treat that's given to them and, it, and only as good as the people that are heat treating them. So I wanted to put that caveat out there. LT, you got anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Steels, heat treats, rock well points, whatever you want to call it, because I've been asked about all of them. I've been uh, questioned on it. You know, why do we do this? Why do we do that? I have to agree with you completely on it. The flavor of the month is the hottest thing right now. That, you know, I mean, we, we run through that. Um, I can tell you why we use A2. I've used O1, I've used 1095, 1075, CPM this, you know, 154s, D2s. I used to be a huge, huge D2 fan because at the time, I was making hunting knives, and they had a fantastic edge retention, and I felt like, man, this is the game I have to go with. Well, once we started getting into the camp craft and wood craft, kind of phased into 01, because, well, it's user-friendly. Uh, it may rust a little more, but, man, it's a tougher edge. It doesn't chip out. You know, it, there's a lot more I could do with the 01, and then I found A2. And for me, even today, I think I actually got asked this today by someone. What was my why or either why what why do i use a2 or what is my favorite steel and a2 why don't you pick one of those super steels I said because we've been using a2 so long that even you know from a point high a point low on a rock well it's still a great using knife it's not rust resistant by any means it's not stainless and remember the word stainless just means it stains less it doesn't mean that it won't rust that's another misconception of stainless. I want this because it won't rust. No, it does not say that. So keep that well, in mind. Well, to LT's point too, uh, what makes a stainless knife um, stainless is that it's not, a, it's not a full carbon blade. But even stainless, it's the carbon molecules that are actually made up within the stainless that helps it retain an edge. It's also why if you know we've all, a lot of us maybe have stainless guns, but if you leave it outside, or put it, but you just put it up, put it back in the case with it wet, it's going to rust. Same with knives. Also, if there are knives out there that have no carbon molecules in them, where they're they are truly stainless where they don't have the same level of carbon or any carbon in them supposedly but they're not normally known for their edge retention their durability or anything that you would really want long term for a knife someplace that works i mean if you're a saltwater diver and that's all you do is spend your time under underwater and you need something to cut um if you were to get you need cut away if you got caught up in rope or uh or a uh, fishing line that would probably be the place where i'd have my full stainless serrated blade that's probably the only application i'm using uh that blade on so that's another misconception too is that uh stainless means it doesn't rust and that that's not not the case at all right. and with your super steels they are harder to sharpen they they're tough they hold great edges um i was always interested in the field maintenance side of it too because that's important to me. Can I do this or do I have to always send it back to the factory? So those are kind of things that I, I think about. Um, another thing that I, I talk to people about when they say, oh, what about, you know, this, this steel and the, and the Rockwell and this, that and the other. 
man, remember the old mountain men and remember the, the Buffalo Skinners. Do you think they knew what the Rockwell of that knife was? No. Good I, point. Their skill set allowed them to take, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say they may not even have been heat treated or done real well. How many buffalo got skinned at that time, you know, in our history by guys? And it was skill set with a good functioning tool that they could maintain and sharpen. So yeah. I always kind of default there. It's like, well, let me look at why this worked so well. You know, if I, I show up and I go, uh, this knife is never going to go dull. You know, I, it's going it's to go dull. Okay. It, it's a piece of metal. It's going to go dull. So I would rather have that skill set knowing how to maintain my knife and knowing the steel is at a rock wall that I can maintain it. It has the flexibility. It has the toughness. It has the, the edge retention in all the right places. And for me, A2 is that, that particular steel. Yeah. Well, we all know those outdoorsmen back then killing Buffalo were using S30V. Yes. <laughs> clearly. At a 61 rock wall. Yeah. 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 Clearly. Yeah. So, so LT, I have a theory on super steels that I want, I, I'd like to get your opinion on. Okay. Um, so I'm 50 and I grew up going to knife and gun shows and, and I think VG 10 and some of these other, you know, you know, the Japanese steel back in the day was this really a driving factor towards kind of an increase in, in the quality of steel. But what I think clever marketing people have kind of realized is that we started moving towards super steel that has greater edge retention because fewer and fewer people actually knew how to sharpen their knives. About the time that we started seeing these super hard knives, these super hard uh, steels is when we also started seeing spa treatments and, and, and sharpening where you send them back to people, you know, because they couldn't do it. So I really believe that, that a lot of this super steel, uh, uh, hullabaloo, whatever you want to call it, uh, a lot of this super steel is as much as a result of a loss of skill uh, you know, used to be your grandfathers and your father, we'd sit around sharpen the knives on the whetstone or do it. And we, we lost that skill set and the super steel kind of moved in there. LT hits a really, really good point is, and I know he spends a lot of time in the field. We spend a lot of time in the field. Super steel is great until you have to resharpen it. And if you, if your knife goes dull in the field, then you have a problem. It's one of the reasons why we like carbon steels and why I prefer like what he's talking about, certain tool steels that are field serviceable to where if I have to maintain this in the field and get it back to a serviceable edge, it's much easier for me to do that if the steel is conducive to that. Now, there's a yin-yang in all this. Edge retention on 1095 isn't as great as LMAX. But at the same time, if you start trying to sharpen LMAX or some of these other things in the field, good luck. It's not going to happen. Not without a significant investment in time. I know that I can take one of our 1095 knives and I, I, can, I can gut and process and quarter full-size Texas hogs. And all I ever have to do is occasionally hit it on a strop and I'm back in action and good to go. And so um, that's, that's, that's where I am on that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and Matt, really, it, it does the skill set behind using the knife, and even as firearms, you know, good shooter, bad shooter. It's t how much time do we put behind our tools? Number one, that there is our biggest thing, and it goes to anything that we're doing in life, any hobby that we do. We, we're doing that hobby, number one, because we like it. So we spend a lot of time doing field craft with our tools and our knives, or, or we're, you know, out hunting a lot, and we're doing a lot of field dressing and, and stuff and skinning, you're going to get better at your craft and you're going to find those sweet spots. And as Shane said, you want to be able to sharpen your knife. That is, again, my opinion. There may be people that like to go out and not have to do that, but I want to know how to do it. And I want to be able to maintain my own knives and guns. You know, if I'm in the field, I want to be able to do that. And A2 does that for me. Now we build CPM 3B knives. We build CPM MagnaCut knives. We have built D2 knives over the years. 
And the reason is because the market wants it. Those people want it. I'm not going to just, ah, you don't want that. Here, just have an A2 knife. They want a 3V knife. I'm in the knife business. So we do make those knives for them. Now, I personally do not have a 3V knife um, myself at this time. And it's just something, you have one, right? <laughs> I think, or is that 01? I don't know. No, it's 3V. It's 3V. And then uh, I'm, this is, uh, this is I believe this one's 3V too. Oh, I thought that was A2. Okay. It's got the X on it. What is that? A 3V. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I do, I, you know, mine right now, mine, uh, I have some AEBLA in here and the A2, which is my Genesis. So that's I like the A, I like AEBL too. Oh, I like this. love it for a stainless goodness. What a great steel that is for sure. Yeah. You know, another steel that is kind of, it sadly got a bad rap. And I'm going to tell you guys, I had a lot of 440C in my life and I, I really kind of liked 440C. I got to preach. Preach. We did, uh, man, we did, uh, our first stainless was 440C and, uh, it was a phenomenal, um, steel uh and if you look at the molecular structure of 440c versus s35 vn i dare anybody to try to figure it out you know without having to do a spectrometer test or something ridiculous you know um 440c is a great steel the sad part about it is is all the other steels in the in the 400 series line kind of kind of gave it a bad name and ruined it and it just okay. wasn't marketable that's probably exactly what it was if they would have called it something else it may still be in favor right now because it was a great steal. You know, I, I really did like that. Um, I mean, you can still get it. There's just not, it's not one of the ones that are, people are clamoring after for sure. You know, I think you like, I'm sure you've seen it where AEBL and O one one kind of fell out of favor. And now you're starting to see uh, some of those tool steals and that AEBL come back pretty strong right now by a lot of makers. And I, I'm glad to see that. Man, when I first started using it, uh, it's in all our kitchen knives for sure. And then we did some uh, GNSs and we have done a few Genesis and AEBL here and there, you know, not, not tons, but I like it for a, for a game food knife. Man, AEBL just is incredible. Uh, we, I put one together and sent it out on a pass around uh, a number of years ago. And the guy who had taken it out to, and had his Boy Scout true. And this was one of our GNSs, so it was a spear point, uh, probably a saber grind in AEBL. And they popped open a bunch of black walnuts. Okay, now if you know what black walnut stain does to everything under the sun, yeah. this knife came back relatively clean. He was so wow. impressed. He said, I had all my scouts messing with this knife and we're popping walnuts and, and messing with this. And I was like, wow, that what a testament for that steel. It is a great steel. Yeah. We've had fantastic results, great feedback on our AEBL stainless for um, all our kitchen knives. So I, that is one of the steels. To me, that's a super steel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that as a super steel. So you guys brought up some interesting aspects that maybe we needed to, uh, need, I can't talk. We need to discuss um, one of the earlier points that Shane brought up was to discuss ed retention edge retention and field service. How about we talk about briefly, what is your guys's process? Okay. You've been out in the field. You've now get, gotten home. What do you do to maintain that edge and you're putting it away or what's your, what is your process for, for sharpening or what are you, are, are there specific oils that you might be using? Are there any kind of treatments that you're, you're using? Uh, what products are you using? So people have an idea of the direction to go to. Because we, as you guys pointed out as well, some people may be using some of these super steels and sending off the, the knife to get resharpened and not realize, you know, there's stuff that we can do ourselves. Why don't we discuss how to do that? Oh, absolutely. Stropping is the biggest start is try not to let the edge get beat up too much. You know, stropping, having a field strop in your pack is, um, that's probably been one of my mainstays in my pack for a number of years, field strop, uh, even for axes, you know, you're, you're chopping some wood down and stuff, uh, just using a field strop. Uh, a, a good 
Arkansas stone for if I got in trouble? Do I got to, you know, did I hit a rusty nail? I got a little chip out and I got to work it out real quick. I, I like to have an aggressive stone, you know, and then I'll worry about, as you said, when I get home, I'll clean it up after I get home. Let me get my job done now. Is that a strop block? Yeah, HCO strop block. There you go. And then a strop bat. Uh, I know uh, that JRE makes some strop bats as well. So for those of you that don't know what a strop is, it is simply a piece of leather. In this case, this is the split side of the leather, leather that has an abrasive compound on it. That's why it's green. Um, that helps sharpen the knife. Uh, this is four-sided uh, with different grits on it, although it's all black. The reason this is turned all black is because it's probably five years old and all the it used to be different colors, but that's what happens when you sharpen a carbon steel blade on a strop is it just turns everything black over time. That lets you know that it's actually pulling metal off of that. Um, so if you imagine the old Western movies where the barber takes the straight razor and sharpens it on what looks like a belt, that's actually a strop and that's what he's actually doing. And also that actually convexes that edge again too, knocks the shoulders off and he may stop mid shave and hit that razor on that strop again uh and, and like i do knife maintenance like i do gun maintenance uh and, and so to me the guy that can't sharpen his own knife is like the guy that can't clean his bolt carrier group in his ar-15 it's like you shouldn't have that if you can't do it if you can't service it then you don't need it because the day comes like we're all buying these things because we enjoy shooting and other things but we also have in the back of our mind that we want if we were to ever need these things we want them to work uh, if a weapon goes down in the field, then it's just a boat anchor unless you can get that weapon back up and, and, and handle it uh, and fix it. And so for me, it's an imperative skill to have if you're going to be a guy that is using knives on a regular basis. And it's also makes you feel really good. Like it's, it's, it's really independent. So if I could give a piece of advice on anything on how to learn how to sharpen, um, one of the things that I always tell people is to buy a magic marker or a permanent marker. And if you're trying to learn on stones, learn on a cheaper knife, preferably one that's, uh, that's high carbon because it's, it's a little more forgiving and take and color that edge, that, that shiny edge with a, um, with a, with a magic marker and then take a few passes on the stones and then you can see where you've taken material off. If, it, if it's black on the edge and then shiny back here towards the top of the bevel, then you have to adjust your angle. Uh, so to me, it's one of the things that you just need to do it. Like there's no, you can watch a thousand YouTube videos on it, but until you just like sit down and start going to town, um, you can't learn it without trying. It's like driving a nail with a hammer until you do it. You know, you don't know. I mean, it takes a little bit of doing, but that once you get it, it's it's a great feeling to have. And then it's uh, I've always been the guy that people brought their brought them their knives to sharpen. And and the key of that is is I very rarely have to sharpen my knives. I do what I call honing my knives, and that's using a straw because I maintain them all the time. And whether it's an LT right made out of 01 or ABL or 3V, which is which is a super tough steel and can be hard to put an edge back on if you let it get dull. I just I don't ever let them get dull. To me, it'd be like taking your scope on and off and just thinking it's going to hold zero. It doesn't do that. So you got to re-zero it every time, right? So if you get your scope mounted, tor torque it down, and then you check zero every now and then. I'm checking zero when I'm touching my nail. Or when I'm running it through, oh, I, I better hit this real quick before I actually have to need it. And, and as the skill set for sharpening is just like the skill set for knife use. You, you do have to use that. The Sharpie idea, we use it in the shop. We tell people that exact same thing. Sharpie that edge, and that's going to help you learn to get the muscle memory for your angle. And guys, let's face it. All our wives' kitchen knives need sharpening. Come on. We know that. They just do. So let's get on them. And there's your practice point. You practice with her old hickory stuff and then you buy her a really good set and don't no. let her use you use them. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. All my good it's kitchen knives. Nice watermelon are... knife and you do yeah. all, wait, honey, I'll get that. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, all, all my good kitchen knives are hidden away um, for that very reason.
<laughs> but yeah, the, the stropping, JRE makes the, the greatest strops. I like them. We, he has a field strop, uh, a strop strap, and a strop bat. And, and one of each is a great thing to have. But if you have a, a fairly aggressive stone, again, used for quick, I got to get, I hit something, I got to get a nick out. As Shane said, strop often. Uh, if you go to a Japanese restaurant and the guy's cutting that stuff, you see him stealing his knife all the time, realigning that edge. He doesn't just do it at the beginning or that he's doing it during the work. There's, you know, they're keeping those things the way they need to be. So the same applies here when you're working with your field knife. Uh, and then when you do get home, whatever means you sharpen with, again, some practice time. Again, I, I have the advantage. I just take mine to the shop and we have belt grinder. You know, we have the buffer. So when you ask me, how do I maintain them at home? I don't. I just put them in a bag and they go to the shop. So it's one of those things. Um, Let's talk about sharpeners real quick, LT. Oh, yeah. I get people that ask me about sharpeners all the time. I highly discourage starting out and learning to sharpen with a powered sharpener. I would much prefer you learn by hand. Uh, these guys that go out and buy these, these work sharps and these other things, they're great tools if you understand the process, but you can hog off a, a lot of material and you can, you can really screw up a, a blade really fast if you don't know how. So I would suggest something like a Spyderco uh, Sharp Maker, uh, which helps you set the bevel. Uh, a little bit. It's good to know what, what, what angle your knife is ground at to begin with. Uh, Lansky Gatco makes guided systems that are, are way easier to use and start out with. If you want to go to, you know, some type of Arkansas stone or some type of flat stone, there's a thousand different kinds out there. I would encourage you in every case to do, to use that trick that LT and I talked about is coloring those edges and checking your work before you, you, uh, you can only take so much metal off and you can't put it back on. And, 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 and so going slow, checking your work uh, is, is the best advice I can give you. And, and don't think of sharpening as a task. Uh, you know, it, it does have to have an enjoyment thing. You know, sitting around, putting an edge on a knife. Come on, when you pick that knife up and you just shoot paper, you shave all the hair off of your arm. That's a proud moment, right? You just put that edge on that knife. So don't don't necessarily be in a hurry. And as Shane said about the power machines, they're great if you know how to use them, because if you don't, you're going to have a bunch of recurved knives. I'm going to tell you right now. You're Gouge. Going to say, hey, well, all, every one of your knives, because you're going to get up there, you're going to start right here, and you're going to go this way for the most part. So this is going to look like this very quickly. And it's yep. just, it just happened. So yeah, learn by hand. That's not a, you know, that's a great idea. Do it that way. It's going to take a while. That's when you sit around and talk to your dad about hunting or something and just sit there and hit that stone and just enjoy it, you know, put some oil on there and, and go to town. Uh, for me, it's a sharpening and, and maintaining knives is a form of, uh, for lack of a better term, meditation. Meditation. Yeah. Yeah. And when I used to own the bike shop, uh, I had a, I had a whole, you know, knife sharpening kit underneath my workbench. And when I would pull out my knife and start stropping my knife, my guys would always say, Oh, he's scheming. He's scheming. So a lot of times when I'm sharpening my knife, I'm working through something in my head and it's just, it occupies my hands so that my mind can kind of relax and, and do something else. And so for whether I'm stropping or sharpening, um, you know, it, it, it is absolutely something that becomes kind of a, for lack of a better term, a Zen-like state, whenever you can sit down, I'm being productive while at the same time I'm calming myself, I'm relaxing, and I'm still, uh, I'm still getting a really sharp knife out of it. So, And, and there is an art to the hand sharpening. Uh, I can remember sitting around watching my dad as a kid, mm -hmm. Marcus Allstone, a knife, and it was almost mesmerizing. You know, yep. you're watching this Thing, and then he would hold up the paper and cut the paper or whatever, or shave the hair. And it was just like, wow, you know, you're a little kid. This is really cool to, to learn that. And that's one of those skills that it's, it's nice to have, whether it be your axes, uh, your lawnmower blades. I mean, you got to, you know, we got guy toys and our toys sometimes require some help now and then. So let's look, let's learn how to sharpen our stuff for sure. Absolutely. Hey, a uh, lawnmower blade's a great place to learn how to start too, as far as working on edge. They need it. Yeah. 
And if you're yeah. re-gargle, no one can see it. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Just Matt. make sure it's turned off. Yeah, yeah. Remove the blade. Yeah. Hard to Not sharpen. Important. While, hard to sharpen while it's moving. Yeah. Um, sheaths. Mm -hmm. Are there any special features, in your opinion, for outdoorsy, bushcrafty, survivally sheaths? Oh yeah, for sure. You want me to start this one? Yeah. So you one of my main questions also is. Um, seeing a lot of the bushcraft type sheaths are much different compared to what I think of as a sheath where exactly, exactly. And then I have one of the Veristalekas right here where it's unique compared to what I think of. If, if you have the coolest knife in the world, okay. And I mean, this thing is your favorite knife on earth and, and you just love that knife. If that sheath is uncomfortable, or if that sheath doesn't retain well, you're not going to carry that knife. I don't care how cool that is. If the package that knife is in it does not carry well and is comfortable, it will sit in the drawer. And I have believed that forever. And that's one of the reasons I got with the spin at JRE. And we do, a, I like to call it the package. When you get a bushcraft knife from us, you get a package. You get a full on sheath. It's a leather, it's a dangler. It has a fire steel loop because that's one of the most important things in the woods, have a way to create fire. It's got a fire steel loop on it. Uh, this is my own personal sheath. So, but it also has uh, the regular hip and or a dangler. Now, why would I, when we designed it that way, when I went to spin and said, hey, I like what you're going on, but I don't like, he used to have them to where they were like this and there was a rivet there. And this was always up. Well, we removed that rivet so we could slide the dangler out of the way. So using the dangler, a lot of advantages are with a dangler. It's winter, your coat's a little longer than your belt line. Now you can still access your knife, okay? It swings when you sit down in your Jeep. You know, there it's not poking in the seat. That's another advantage. So what are the advantages of the hip side? Well, it's cold out. I want this tucked up tight under my jacket. You know, I don't want there, it's moving around on me. I want it up tight. So the advantage of having two ways to carry it right out of the box, you can cut off the dangler and you still have the D-ring and you can paracord it to any of your gear, you know, that kind of thing as well. The two open grommets at the bottom to add additional gear too. you know, the little clip on things here and there. We use um, an eight ounce leather that is double dyed. We get the leather from Wicket and Craig and they split it down to eight, so we get true eight. And then they double dye it inside and out. So this is not just dyed on the outside, it's completely dyed inside. And he does a double stitch down the side, if you can, I don't know if you can see that. And again, from, um, uh, there we go, double stitch right there. You know, given it has a welt in it, you know, so there's all those advantages. He's a fantastic sheath maker, and it's a fantastic package altogether. And this is my setup just like that um, with the, this is my whole rig setup right there. So that, I like sh the leather for that particular thing. Tactical, you know, the, the Kydex, we make tons of Kydex and, and Shane, I think you have, a, I don't have any with me to show, but I think you probably had something there, don't you? Yeah, he's got some Kydex there, there you go. A great sheath option. Kydex is a wonderful thing. Uh, leather, wet forming leather, um, snow sealing leather, using ballastone leather, you know, all of those things. I snow seal all of my stuff and, and form fit it around, you know, the nooks and crannies to keep better retention on your knife as your leather does wear and, and expand a little bit. So uh, I'm a big fan of this Gundy style flat bottom bushcraft sheath. This is, that's my favorite, hands down. So a couple of things I'll add to it is, uh, so he's talking about JRE. It's actually JRE Industries. If you guys are looking for somebody, Spin and his wife over there are just cool folks that do a phenomenal job. Uh, they make all LT sheaths uh, and they know the SE lineup very well and they can tell you what knives fit what sheaths if you want a higher quality sheath. So this is one of LT's knives, Camrat. 
Uh, and you might notice that on a lot of my sheaths, you'll see that I've got a little bit of cordage wrapped around it because we always need it. Uh, but one thing I do on some of his sheaths is you might be able to tell there's actually green uh, strop compound on this. And so there's been times whenever if I need to touch this up, and actually I need to add some more compound to it. But you can see there's some green. I can actually use the split end of that, of that sheath as a strop. So this is uh, one of the leather pouch sheaths made by JRE, and it's on a smaller knife on the Camrat. Um, now, this is one of our sheaths on a larger knife. So if I'm wearing this on my uh, directly on my belt, because it's smaller, it's going to be less likely to get in the way. But even still, getting in and out of the vehicle, doing certain things, if I'm hopping up and down off a tractor or something, if I catch this edge on something or the bottom part of the sheath, it can pull pretty hard on that. On a knife this size, it can definitely pull really hard. So I hear a lot of people oftentimes kind of uh, throw shade at a dangler sheath option. But what I like about the dangler sheath is is before I came on staff, I designed this sheath and had a guy build it for my favorite knife. And I, I wore this knife for, you know, 72 hours solid, never took it off, uh, would lay down, crawl around, do whatever I had to do with the sheath. But because the knife moves, it doesn't get hung on stuff and it's not bouncing around in a way that you would think it's going to be really annoying. I just like the freedom of movement that it gives. Uh, one thing you'll notice on virtually, I noticed uh, LT had some too. Uh, when you get a, a knife that is as deep in the sheath as this one is, it can be hard to, to, to remove from the sheath. So what I have a lot of times is a little five or six knot snake knot, and that's how I grab it, and the knife comes out, and then I restructure my grip whenever I need to. So on almost every knife that you see me present here today, you're going to see just a little bit of paracord on, on every single one because it aids in getting these knives. You don't have to fight with getting a knife out of the sheath. It's not super long. It doesn't get in the way. And all I'm doing is just grabbing that with my finger and pulling the knife out right there. Uh, new knife maker, guy named Scott Cretol Outdoors, really one of our former students, really cool guy right there. So I'm a sucker for custom knives, especially when they're by makers of people that I like and respect. So uh, I used to have a, I still have a pretty deep collection, uh, but I have offloaded just about everything uh, that I don't have a personal relationship with the maker. And so I've got tons of LT and James Gibson and Russell Reese from Cahutta Knives and a lot of the guys. So it's cool to have those friends. Um, to, to revisit what he was talking about with Kydex in this particular place, very useful neck knife. Um, once again, you'll see I've got paracord on there. This is a Viking whetstone by the guys at Wazoo Survival. And then also a little gouge or awl here made by Bushcraft Kelso because when I'm bushcrafting, sometimes you got to poke holes and stuff. And, uh, and so that little all does a great job. So I've got one little package right there that handles just about everything I need to do in a really quick and concise way. That's about, that's about the only knife I ever use, unless I'm just wanting to use other knives for our advanced bushcraft plans. Also noticed uh, the paracord. Oh, and now you take off your ears. I see how it is. Uh, oh, your, yeah. Your uh, paracord also is orange which kind of makes sense on a couple points. So I like to have something with a little pop of color. If you notice a lot of, a lot of the knives that I'm showing you are all kind of earth tone, you know, they're browns and, and dark greens and grays and whatever. So, uh, you know, we make, if you look at our lineup on the SE lineup, uh, we have some venom green, some, some super neon green, blades and orange handles i've got a, a hungless two here with with some g10 orange scales um sadly 
that that when we debuted those colors, it kind of coincided with the whole zombie apocalypse thing, but it had nothing to do with that. Um, our company was uh, born on the floor of the Amazon jungle, and the jungle is known to eat things. And, and so it, everything I have, I, I kind of standardize all my stuff in some type of orange. Uh, I'm prone to loaning stuff out. And, and I don't always get it back. So if I see somebody using a, a, a knife with an orange lanyard, then I know that's my knife. Give me my knife back. Uh, and so even my little uh, Swiss Army knife here has a little small lanyard on it. Uh, and my most carried fixed blade is my little CR 2.5, once again, with that little small orange lanyard there. So... I just noticed we forgot to mention or to discuss handle materials okay. and posit positives and negatives of various options, if there are any. Oh, yeah, there, there definitely is uh, natural versus micartas and the G10s and, and different things. Um, for me, if I'm going to use, again, if, if we're talking a working knife that I'm going to go out in the woods with, personal preference. I like a matte finished micarta. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, it can get wet. It can get bloody. And I, it, it wipes up nice. I always feel that the micarta in the matte finish gets a little sticky if it gets wet, if you're sweating or if it's raining or whatever. So it, it feels like I, I get a good purchase on it. Natural materials are a wonderful thing. The great antlers, your woods, um, natural materials move. You're going to, potentially have some spine you know issues where you, you get a little bit of shrinkage in your materials that's just part of it being a natural material antler is a wonderful material to work with but in no preference in a working knife the g10s are great for the bright colors uh, again my kitchen knives these are you know my wife and i we like the toxic green you can see them sticking out of our knife block we know what they're you know we know these are ours when we go to a camp out right <laughs> Mm -hmm. These are art, so we we work that. Um, but in, in the using knife, I, I still am a fan of the micartas. I I really am. We saw a ton of black, green, and natural micartas. Uh, tons of G10s, liner materials, and and the same with the natural. Desert ironwood being probably our biggest selling wood. Uh, what a fantastic, stable, oily, dense wood, and beautiful. My good. Goodness. Iron wood knives are gorgeous. So that's kind of uh, where we lean on on material things. So uh, to add to that, uh, micarta is really just a, this is a, a uh, canvas micarta. It's just a, a layers of fabric canvas in this, in this, in this case uh that's impregnated with epoxy and then put under compression and then we wind up making this a few things about micarta is that it's going to stain so as you as you take on as you use it with sweat with oils with blood it will stain it will darken i think it gives it character we get some people that yeah. buy our knives and and then want to keep it always clean and it's like man it just just don't buy our knives because that's that's never going to happen like the only way that's going to stay clean is if you never use it so understand this is a tool all right that's how we view it um so i like the grip that my carta has um uh wet dry bloody not bloody it always maintains good grip uh, a thing about a g10 is that a G10 blade is a, this is essentially a, a plastic, a plastic style handle that you put texture on. Now, one thing I'll say about a G10, this is, this is our hungless two. This is a, I think it's a, like an 8.3 cutting blade, uh, cutting edge. So it's, it's, it's a big blade moving into a chopper. I have found that G10 is a more dense and heavier material and in the case of this particular knife, I had a micarta scale uh, set of scales on there and I moved to a G10, moved the weight and the balance point back a little bit. And I prefer the heavier G10 scales on there because it made the knife feel different. So I would be willing to bet that, that LT could say he could make the same blank on two different blades and, and it's going to feel different on a G10 than it is on a micarta. 
Oh, absolutely. Definitely denser. And they work different from making knives standpoint too. Absolutely. You can put a piece of G10 on a, a grinder and it acts, a, I can route my, my card. I can't route my G10. You know, there right. are a lot of differences in it. The, I, the biggest thing with G10 is, is the bright colors. If you just said, what is the best? They both work really, really well. Uh, you're going to get different attributes. You're going to get a weight thing, a density thing. But the advantage of the bright orange, the blues, the greens, there's, you know, those are a much brighter thing on G10 right now. So that's, so, that's kind of, now can't, now my card as Shane said, the canvas, uh, he said it will get darker. You can see the black candle. have tarnished it and it is now very, very dark green, you know, and, and whatever else I've gotten on it for years, but it, it does, it's, it patinas the handle, you know, so it kind of adds its own character to it as well. So, but they also make, um, besides this, is, this is canvas as well, uh, for a tighter micarta, they make a linen and they also make a paper micarta and each one of them working the handles down, uh, they work a little bit different and they give you a different look at the end. Like if you have a piece of polished black paper micarta, it almost looks like black plastic or buffalo horn polished. Yeah, it's just, ebony. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. It's a fantastic look. And L linen is a unique look in itself, you know. LT, you guys have done some of the canvas, uh, or not burlap micarta. Burlap, yeah. That's yeah. really cool. And I really like the way that looks too. Um, Years ago, we did some stuff with bone, and it just didn't go well on a hard use knife. Uh, if you screw up and and hit the the scale with a baton or drop a knife, you're far more likely to have it chip out on a, on some natural materials that aren't stabilized. Um, so we just we just we just stay in the in the in the micarta in the G10 arena. Um, something else that you'll get with some natural materials is if you make like we live in the Southeast and you make that knife in the Southeast and then you ship it to our buddy over in Phoenix, you could potentially get some movement with the wrong material just because that environment sucking all the, I mean, it, it's going to shrink it down. So LT, do you guys see some of that or have, have you experienced that? Oh, absolutely. Um, maple is bad about that a lot of times. The desert iron wood, surprisingly, is very stable. But still, it'll move a little bit. Um, and that's just one of the things I hope people understand when they buy a natural handled knife, whether it be antler or wood for that, or bone, um, that you're going to have some material. And it's going to, in one environment, it's going to swell. In another environment, it's going to shrink. You know. Um, Sometimes your pins will be proud in the winter and in the summer they're flush. You know, it, it's just, yep. it's, it, it's just one of those things. And we do experience that. And, uh, you know, it's a warranty thing. Sometimes you warranty the product, but at the same time, it's like, can you wait six months and it'll be flat flush again? You know, kind of thing. Yep. Uh, he, he's correct. And if you're hitting it, if you're dropping it, if it's a good knife, man, stay with your G10s, your artist. If you're going to have a field dressing, you're going to do one piece of game a year at camp and you want to show off, get you an ironwood, you know, on dyed bone or something. That's, I mean, who, who doesn't like a, you know, a little stag knife, a D2, one blade trapper. I love those things. Yep. Yep. That's good stuff to know. Okay, so we covered serrations. Misunderstood concepts. Have we, are there additional ones that we haven't addressed yet? Uh, I'd like to circle back. We just barely talked about Rockwell, but I, I do want to just kind of give you a little bit on, on some Rockwell. As we said earlier, like those early Buffalo guys didn't know what the Rockwell that night was. Let's be honest. They had no, they had just, it worked for them. I think sometimes get hooked up on and this go back to the flavor of the month so and so said this steel will take 62 plus rockwell and you know what it will you're absolutely right that knife will do but it goes back to, i make that knife for you 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 sell it to your friend bob who sells it to fred and fred goes to alaska 
and now he has a 62 Rockwell, and he's going to go out and baton frozen wood with it. It may not, not like the, the results of, of that. So over the years, asked me, well, why don't you put your A2 at the top and the wrong? I said, well, because over the years we've done, we've come at the low side, we've come at the high side, we found that Goldilocks Rockwell, let's say. It, you know, it's, it's just right. And for us, is a rock well between 57 and 59. We generally run that mainly across the boards on all of our stuff. Okay, even if that steel can take a 61 and it might, it can be a little bit higher. We have found, again, we're making thousands and thousands of knives that they're going everywhere and, you know, all kinds of things are being done with these knives. So we want to have good experience. I don't want the guy to be unhappy because it either didn't hold a edge or it broke because the rock wall was so we find that spot. So not be so much hump on, on of a knife. If you take that knife and they it's a user and you understand the honing as Shane, Shane said, don't let it get dull. You won't have to take as much steel away to bring an edge back. Hone it now and then service your equipment, clean your guns, all of those things fall in line. We know to do this, we just don't sometimes. So let, let's get into that habit, not get so hung up on the super steels and the Rockwell, enjoy the knife for what it is. And uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, like with, with SE and that, I mean, we've been friends for a number of years and, and not only the knives, but the people behind the knives. That is what we're, you know, I have a lot of friends in the knife industry that are knife makers like I am, and we're more than just competitors, we're friends. You know, matter of fact, uh, his boss, a number of years ago, him and I were talking at the Blade Show, and he says to me, LT, uh, we're not competitors. We're, <laughs> we're in the knife business. You know, we're here, we're helping each other. He said, if a guy buys your knife, you know what, he's a knife guy, he's probably going to buy one of mine. And if he buys one of mine, he's probably going to get your knife too. Knife guys don't just have one knife or one brand. We got, they got lots of stuff. And, you know, I sat there and I was like, Jeff, you're absolutely right, man. We're, we're in this. Let's bring all ships up. You know, let's just be friends. We get along. And the knife industry as a whole, there are a lot of fantastic makers out there. And we share stuff. I have no secrets that I'm willing to tell anyway. So, you know, there, but it, People can call me, and I've had young makers literally call the shop, and my wife will give me the phone, and the guy will say, hey, I know of your company. I've heard you, you know, your company's reputation. I'm just starting out. What would you suggest I do? And, and I would tell him, hey, call this guy. He'll help you get your steel. Here's where I get my belts. This is who does some of our heat treat right down the line. And best of luck, man, call me. Show me a picture of that first knife when you get it up and running. You know, because if we don't do that stuff, the industry can't get better and better and better and better. You know, all the guys in my shop, when they came to work for me and they, and they didn't know how to make knives, my goal is not to make them a little bit less than I am and let me be the boss and the big guy and the big head honcho. I want that guy to be a better knife maker than me so that we can take our company and the whole knife craft into that next arena, you know, into that next place. And man, the whole, there's a lot of guys in the knife industry and SE is a big part of that, that are free with the information. And yeah, man, here, talk to this guy, go over here and see this. We've, we've exchanged information so many times you wouldn't believe it. And it yep. just, it helps everybody get better. So, so all of those things combined and man, don't worry about the rock wall as much as the company that you're getting the knife from the knife itself and the people behind that knife. Because if those things are right, I don't care what that rock wall is. I'm telling you right now, I'm a happy guy. Yep. Yeah. That is wonderful. Well, absolutely. absolutely wonderful. Um, some of my favorite gunsmiths, holster makers, instructors, gun industry people all have so similar philosophies and they're open doors, sharing ideas, working together. It's, it's awesome to, to have, uh, to hear that and to know that's yeah that that's like that with certain people in the knife industry that's just awesome except for with shane yeah you can't you can't you can't please everybody but uh man i to echo what what uh, lt says is that uh, uh 
we don't view people as competition and, and we have so many friends in there. And, and I think people that operate like we do and like LT does, it shows um, that we're focused on our mission, not somebody else's mission. And, and so that mission focus is liberating and freeing. Uh, we don't feel compelled to keep up with the steel of the month. Uh, we don't feel compelled to, to have to follow trends. Uh, we're going to do what we feel is right. And, and fortunately, uh, that's worked out pretty well for us so far. It, it may at some point bite us, but uh, we don't feel a need to keep up with anybody because if we don't feel good about doing it, then we don't do it. And so when you operate from that locus, when you operate from that situation, then, then you don't really have to worry about anybody else or what they're doing. And you're free uh, to help others or to receive help or, or, or to receive feedback from other people as well. So uh, it's, it's a, um, it's a maturity in a company that I've seen with LT that I've seen with his people. It's, it's something that I'm fortunate that I did, I'm not, all I'm doing here to here at SE is, is trying to honor what our founders have, um, have went ahead and set forth and just make sure that we continue to do things the way that they want it done from day one. And so that legacy is important to me. Um, it's why it's, uh, you know, being around guys like LT and so many other people in our industry that are so giving, I've learned so much, uh, even on this, uh, it's nice when you're the weakest link of the chain, because you're always learning, you always have the opportunity to learn. And I, as the weakest link, let me just tell you, this has been awesome. Um, Alex had a very good observation, <clears throat> excuse me, Alex from uh, Shooted Suitist, Shoot, Suited Shootist. Yeah, he's going to give me a hard time about that one later. <clears throat> Talking about misconceptions, in addition to snake oil, are there some ideas that you guys can think of that oh, yeah. sounded good, but in practice isn't a good idea as far as knives are concerned? I'll go first because I already got, I, I, I kind of alluded on this. It's serration. Like, oh. Uh, well, we've talked about serrations, but on the front of the knife or on the edge of the knife, then we talk about serrations on the, on the spine of the knife um, where now, now your knife's a knife, but now it's a saw. Well, now it's a hammer. Well, now it's a, a, a survival kit inside this. Well, at some point, the knife quits being a knife. And, and really, I want my knife to be a really good knife and good at knife stuff versus um, versus being like kind of half-assed at like 15 things. So if, if I want a knife that's going to do, you know, have a lot of different features, I'm going to use a Swiss army knife or a multi-tool uh, because th that works better. But when it comes to a fixed blade knife that I'm using for bushcraft, survival, general camp use, I just want it to be a good knife. You know, I don't need it to have all the other stuff with it. LT? Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I like simplicity and, and a lot of things. And the Genesis is one of those things I think is just a, a bare bones simplicity. Um, yeah, I don't want a flashlight on there and I, and I don't <laughs> want to saw back on a particular knife. And exactly. Again, that goes back to the skill set side of things as, as well, your skill set. Um, Gimmicks, uh, Alex, I guess the biggest thing to, to take away is um, the gimmick side of things. You know, yeah, some people can use them well, I guess, but um, I, me personally, I don't really like the gimmicky things that much. Every now and then, it's kind of neat, but I guess not. I just like simple, simple. Well, there's elegance and simplicity and in that purpose-built tool. Uh, and, and so for me, a hammer is really straightforward and, and it really gets things done. Um, you don't often find a bottle opener on a hammer or a flashlight on a hammer or a screwdriver on a hammer. It's just a hammer because I need it to drive nails and a knife's made to stab and cut. And that's, that's really what I feel like that the, the elegance and the, the, the simplicity and the function is what makes the tool. And, and so for me, that goes back to if you need all that other stuff, then, then you might need to do a skill assessment or a, maybe a skill audit and say, do I really need all these things? And, and then go from there. You know, and that's, a, that's another good point. I think sometimes people miss this thing. It, it's easy for 
us guys that have been doing things for a long time, whatever that task or, or hobby is, to tell a guy who's getting into it, hey man, you don't need it, okay? But it, it's hard for him because he never had it. So it's one of those knowledge things. You have to gain the knowledge and use about all this stuff to know that you don't need it. Mm -hmm. that stuff. Because you, now you don't ever have to wonder, could I have done better had I had this thing with me? But now that I've gone out and taken the fear away because I've gained the knowledge and what maybe maybe it's just knife sharpening. I don't have to have a thousand dollars worth of knife sharpening now because I can do it with a strop and stone. But mm -hmm. I don't know if I could do it better with the, that equipment unless I went down that rabbit hole a little bit, you know, and, and got the knowledge base to come back and go, I can stay on simplicity, the easy side, the efficiency side, because I've already tested the waters over here. Experience, we all got to go through it, right? <laughs> well, I think we're always wanting to press the easy button. And so we've, we've, we've just, uh, we've been at, we've kind of conditioned ourselves and our expectations for something to be easy. And, and so there is no shortcut to playing a guitar. There's no short shortcut to shooting a firearm in a very, very efficient and accurate manner. There's no shortcut to knife skills or knife maintenance. So it's just one of those things that you have to double down, invest in, and understand that that investment is not just an investment in your knife and your, in your tools. It's an investment in your skill set. It's making you a more capable person as well. Great stuff. I almost kind of don't want to bring up the next point I have because I think this has really been a, a complete episode. Yeah, we, could, we could probably get that last pointer on another episode, the multi-tool thing. Um, oh, we could, yeah, we could hit that real quick. Sure. So yeah, uh, basically the, the question was concerning multi-tools and they are helpful, they're useful, but they're not all at the same level. Not only that, but they're also not all providing the exact same features. And so in one of Shane's uh, recent Instagram posts, he, he spoke about one that was very handy for him. And so it got me thinking, you know what? This wouldn't be a bad thing to discuss too, because again, we're talking tools here. So Shane. Uh, so man, you can just become a wash in and a sea of options for, for multi-tools. Uh, there's a ton out there. Uh, they all have different warranties. I have personally had really good experience uh, with SOG tools. Uh, I broke one on a search and rescue um, uh, on a mission and I sent it back to them and I wasn't real sure how they were going to respond. And they sent me a brand new one and they were killer about it. Um, same with Leatherman tools. Uh, I've had really, really good experience at a Leatherman. I've been, and I've got, I don't even know how many of them stashed in a lot of different places from a Leatherman mutt that's located in a chest rig, um, or in a, in a plate carrier, um, which is a phenomenal tool for, for, uh, an AR as far as that platform, uh, to, I generally carry a Leatherman signal on my search and rescue missions. And, and then I know Jeff carries a, uh, I think it's called a CX skeletal. Jeff Randall is one of the owners of SC knives, never carries a knife, always has a, uh, skeletal CX, I think in his pocket all the time. Um, so he's on a third generation farm working outside every day. I just think, uh, 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 a Leatherman tool, uh, or, or, a, or a multi-tool, uh, is something that's absolutely essential to have, especially in certain applications. And that's to include, um, I would almost group in, even though I know Victorinox makes a true multi-tool, but Swiss army knives and, uh, and they they've got some very good multi-tools as well. So it, it's mission to, it's mission dependent. What do you need? What are you trying to do? That will dictate what tools is on your multi-tool. How, how are you going to carry it? How often are you going to carry it? Where are you going to put it? That kind of thing. Yeah. And I too am a fan of multi-tools. Uh, we use them every day in the shop in our, our normal environment. As you said, at the beginning of the show, you use your knife to open packages every day. Well, we use our pliers to pull out rivets of Tidex when we, one splits or, you know, just multiple things that you just run into to use the, the pliers full. Um, so I, I have a super tool that I use and I've used it mm -hmm. on my property many, many, many times. You know, it, a few simple tools, a Phillips screwdriver, a regular screwdriver, uh, the saw 
my goodness, the saws on a multi-tool, I'm telling you what, those are pretty sweet. I have cut down some nice, nice little saplings in my day with that saw on a multi-tool. And the back of that is so 90 degrees. What a fire start on the back of the saw on multi-tool. And um, are you familiar with the, I think it's a Swiss Army, the, the Army model, the green one-hand trekker? Uh, the Ranger. Right? Man, do I like that knife. That is, um, that, that's in my backpack as well. It's got green handles on it. I, I thought it was like the one, one hand has a nice blade on it, but the saw on that is my favorite saw on any of my multi-tool. So Ruben Bollier is one of our, one of our adjunct, uh, ad hoc professors, instructors, uh, guy just travels the world. He's a, he's a Swiss army knife expert. So the Ranger and the Outrider is the mount model that Patrick really likes the most. The Outrider is actually a lot has a lock back or a locking blade on it, which is nice. Uh, they have the longest saws available within that lineup, and and they're super effective at at, at bushcraft stuff, just general use. I would much rather use a saw than to try to chop down a tree with one of our blades. Um, Absolutely. And, and saw ass cutters. My gosh, they're nice little saws. Some of the worst cuts we have seen uh, in some of our classes have come from saws that have jumped the cut and, and people weren't careful with hand placement. Normally, if you're saw and people have their hand like this, you really want to have it like this. And, uh, and that's a pretty gnarly cut whenever you get bit by one of those things. And uh, so, um, but yeah, that, that's a whole, that's a pretty deep dive on, on, uh, to go in super deep. Uh, but I would say top of the heat for me is Leatherman, Sog and, and Victorinox when it comes to, to what's out there. There's, I, I've got buddies that use Gerber. I, I can't speak to Gerber cause I don't have first firsthand knowledge with them, but, uh, those are my choices and I would be fine with using any of those. Yeah, I agree. I like the Victorinox stuff. You know, Swiss Army knives are great. You just pick the one you like with the, they make them with every feature on the world. Just get the yep. few features that you're going to truly use. You'll love that knife. And, and as far as a multi tool, yeah, yeah, that's a nice one. Nice. That's, nice. A, that's the Alox Farmer X. That's my favorite yeah, that's configuration. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, nice low setup. And then, uh, you, you know, your multi tool, you pliers, a couple screwdrivers, and uh, that's all. If they didn't come with a saw, I don't know if I'd like it as much because I, I'm telling you, I don't know if you've noticed, I am a real fan of the saw. <laughs> that. I just got to wonder how many people are, I know because I, on my other screen, I'm pulling up everything you guys bring up just so I have a better <laughs> reference. I wonder how much stuff we sell per episode. I don't know, man. I don't know. I know how much uh, I, I'm sitting here on a sea of knives and I've got more in a drawer downstairs. So um, but I look around and I get good feelings at all this stuff. Cause it's all people I know and people I'm friends with and, uh, and, and stuff gets used too. So I think there's something pretty cool about using, using a knife that I've been to the guy's shop and, and we've talked and had conversations and it's just a cool knife. And, um, and more importantly, uh, I get working heirlooms that I get to pass on to my sons at some point too. And absolutely. I, and I, and I hope that we have the opportunity to continue to build memories with these tools and do certain things. And uh, I, I guess my prize and most, one of my most prized knives is a case double X that belonged to my big dad, my grandfather that, you know, I, I watched the guy cut fuel line with it and then cut an apple and, you know, and, and, uh, Did the uh, apple that, taste weird though afterwards, man, it tastes, it tastes one of the best tasting apples in my memory. Even with I the remember. gas. Yeah. Because <laughs> I remember, I remember him doing it. It wasn't necessarily back to back, but, I know. but, but we did see, uh, he cut an onion with it too. So normally I would shy away from that, but, uh, but, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff where guns and knives can be tied to memories and experiences if we use them. And, and it's the use part of it to me that, that that's really important is to learn the tools, go make the memories, develop the skill that, you know, should it come down to it? So, you know, should it come down to it someday and all you have is this Leatherman Micra, then I'm going to know to get the most out of that tool that I possibly can. Um, and, and one other point I'd like to make as we, I feel like we're kind of sensing getting close to the end is um, so 
if we go out on a ruck and we're carrying a plate carrier and let's just say we're carrying, you know, three or four mags of five, five, six, we don't just walk out there and start popping off. Well, generally speaking, if we were doing this for, you know, from a tactical standpoint, we're not just going to be popping off rounds and doing this. We can serve our ammo, right? We protect our ammo. We make sure that, that, that every time we pull the trigger, I used to say 40 cents, 40 cents. Now it's like 80 cents, 80 cents, 80 cents. Every time I'm ripping on the trigger for an AR. So, um, so to me, this part of a knife, this edge is our ammo. So I want to protect and conserve it. So, so rather than, you know, taking my knife and using it and then sticking it in the ground. If you want to see somebody lose their mind or just like gasp, <gasps> that would, if you just stuck your knife in the ground, that would be, that would be like the, the just doing a mag dump because you didn't feel like unloading the mag to me. It just, it's completely unnecessary. So I talk a lot about getting the most out of your tools, but learning to be efficient. Uh, LT talked about a nine degree spine. Like if I want to make a marshmallow stick, you know, I'm not going to use my edge. I'm going to take that nine degree spine and I'm going to take that green bark off of that because I'm still saving my edge. I'm conserving ammo. I'm hitting you with a buttstock versus, you know, popping off a few rounds. So using that nine degree spine, learning the nuance of being efficient and effective with your tool is one of the things that I think it needs to be a discipline that we develop. And, and so learning how to not just get the most out of that tool, but to conserve it, to, to preserve it so that when you need it, it's always got a sharp edge and it's ready to go. So that's one kind of a one final point that I've been kicking around and want to make sure we got out there. I, I wish you could see my screen because the final thing I was going to ask is perfectly in line with that because we've been talking about the tools but we haven't really talked, we haven't discussed the, uh, the skill sets. So for you guys, who can you recommend? Where do people go to get, to expand these skill sets? Someone like me who, okay, I know how to use a knife, but what you just said about taking the green off a, a limb, I never thought of that. That's just cool. Where are places people can go to learn that kind of stuff? Where can they learn these greater outdoor skills and how to maximize their tools? Uh, the most uh, economical way is YouTube, you know? And oh, I mean, I mean, even like uh, professional classes, because oh, everyone's well, a lot of people are willing to spend money and they'll go to that carbine class or go to the pistol class. Well, why don't we, what about those cool classes that can be a vacation and we go off and we learn and we enjoy it. The most, uh, let me, let me backtrack there. The most yeah. economical way is YouTube. The problem with YouTube is you have to wade through uh, a lot that's all kind of on the same plane. Everybody's kind of graded on the same plane as far as uh, somebody could be a complete quack versus somebody who has real skill and they only have, you know, four subscribers. Uh, so YouTube is there if you want to just graze and see what's out there. Um, looking at, uh, look for a tri-stick, Morris Kahansky tri-stick is, is a skill-based thing. Feather sticks is another good one that teaches knife control. Uh, Craig Caudill, Nature Reliance School, was you know was our last podcast. Uh, he's up based near uh, LT there. Of course, we're Randall's Adventure and Training. We teach a class or two a year on this stuff. Uh, uh, there's lots of good people out there. I would encourage you to vet the instructors. Uh, look at course curriculum. Look at what they have going on. Uh, a lot of fly-by-night folks out there. Um, uh, but for most of this stuff, Man, part of it is just go pick a task and go learn how to do it. Uh, LT mentioned making a pot hook or carving a spoon or carving. I spend so much time around a fire working on skill, carving really ugly, poorly designed spoons, but they still manage to get food to my mouth. So, you know, it works. Um, so I think, uh, I think those are important. I will say this too. Uh, LT has a class that I fully intend to, uh, to take at some point or did, are you still doing knife builder classes, LT? We just talked about getting them back up and running because of the whole COVID thing. They were shut down for a while, um, but they should start back up next year. Yeah. We're going to start okay. and, and we'll have the, the flat grind and the Scandi grind and, and uh, custom class and, and different things coming up. Yeah. They fill awesome. up quick. 
And, and at, again, that's a great way to get basic skills, how, how to make a knife. And we do go through things and we try to I keep it on a level like if you don't have all of the equipment, how can we do it? So we heat treat with torches because you can get a friend of yours. You can trade heat treat, you know, torches. When I first started making knives full time, I had to, my father-in-law had a set of torches. So I would go over, I didn't even have torches to heat treat. I went over to his garage in the evenings and we heat treated knives. I can remember trading uh, antler for heat treat. You know, there's, there's some things you can get out there and barter with your buddy down the street. That guy might have a hot rod shop, but he's got torches, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and, and you become friends and he helps you get your heat treatment going. Uh, he may have a certain grinder you don't have. You, you just never know that a lot of that is um, easy to come by. And so I show you the way I started, the tools I had and that kind of thing. So our classes are a great way to come in and learn how to make classes. And I think you mentioned uh, the Randall training for, you know, the outdoor skills. Craig, what a great guy to go to uh, knowledge base, you know, for all, all, all things outdoors for Craig. Yep. And then Georgia Bushcraft, a bunch of guys. Yeah, guys. yeah. I mean, the whole co-op thing down there, my goodness. Uh, that's a place you want to come for a weekend and just kind of get your feet wet. Go to one of the Georgia Bushcraft events. And that's coming up. Casey's event is Georgia Bushcraft located in Watkinsville, Georgia. That's coming up um, November, first weekend in November, like November 4th through the 6th, I think, something like that. Uh, and we, you, I'll, I'll be there. You're going to be there. Yeah, too. I'll be there. Yeah. So we'll both be down there. Um, and usually a lot of classes on different things. You, you may go from fire making to, like you said, a tri stick to a feather sticking class. Who knows? Yep. You know, maybe even tracking. I don't know what's going on, but. Yeah, that's great. So there are places, probably, if you just spend a little time on the internet, um, depending on where you lived, I'm sure there's a suitable survival instructor outdoors, you know, forage, you know, foraging is a good thing to get into. Yeah. Someone in your area or, or within an hour or two drive, I'm sure you can find someone that is, that can at least get you started because that's the key get started, get some, yeah. get a day's worth of knowledge and then start building on it. As, as much as I hate to, uh, to advocate it, uh, there are a ton of Facebook groups out there that, that will, uh, that you can actually learn from in, in some of those places. Um, so, um, there's some that want to dress up like buckskin and, and, you know, go out with their black powder rifle. But then there's also guys that really want to focus on certain skills and other things too. So finding the right group that suits you is uh, no more than a few clicks away, I would guess. Well, speaking of which, there is a primary and secondary group, P and S hyphen preparedness. And that kind ah. of stuff's discussed fairly regular. And we have some knowledgeable people that can help and they make sure that people aren't being dumb. Send me an invite on that because I missed that one somewhere. Sure. Uh, LT, I have one last question for you. Who do you sound like? Your voice is so familiar. Like it's, it's a famous either radio person or an actor throughout, as we've been talking all, through this whole episode, I'm thinking, man, he sounds so familiar. And I'm trying to, I, I know I'm going to watch some movie or something and go, that's who he sounds like. I have all my life had, People say, man, you should do radio. And oh, yeah. That and the other. And I, I know. I, I don't know who I sound like. When I hear it, I'll tell you. Okay. You send me an email because I'm curious. Yeah. Like, yeah. No. And, I, and, I, and I'm hoping also if you're listening and you're hearing him talk and you go, hey, he sounds like whoever this is. Let go. me know. And then I'll pass on to him as well. Because um, yeah, I'm not getting royalties from it right now. It's not fair. Time, so we can yeah. get that change. Right. And, and yeah, voice acting, that's, you can make some money off that sure. being, being the most recent cartoon. Um, awesome discussion. I think it is time as Shane pointed out, I think we, yeah, we've, we've covered so much. This has been such a, such a good discussion. Uh, let's cover uh, final thoughts and then also plugs. And in those plugs, make sure you include uh, where people can find you. So Shane. Uh Shane Adams 90 on Instagram is my personal stuff. I'm also on Facebook, uh, SE knives on Instagram, SE rat pack podcast on Instagram. 
Uh, we also do our own uh, SE Rat Pack podcast. It's available on all uh, major directories. We're kind of new to the podcast game, so we have like 14 followers. Uh, but uh, but we're growing. Maybe we'll have 16. Um, so uh, we're on we're on Instagram and Facebook mainly. Uh, although I dabble in Reddit and and some of these other places. I hate them all. But uh, the deck stacked against us there. But Instagram is probably one of the best ways to get in touch with us. Uh, of course, we've got the uh, the old school uh, seknives.com and railsadventure.com uh, on the interweb there. Any final thoughts? No, uh, we're just, I'm just honored to be here. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm the marketing director. Uh, Patrick is our guy that's got way more skill than I do, but, but he's camera shy. But, um, Always honored uh, to be around LT. I always, I appreciate, I asked him to come here and I, I'm grateful that he did. Uh, and uh, thanks to you, Matt, and, and your folks, primary and secondary, your audience. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if we can help in the future, just let us know. Sounds great. Thank you. LT? Well, you guys can find us at ltwritenives.com. We also do have a Facebook and an Instagram. Uh, just kind of search LT Right Knives stuff. Uh, we do have our own podcast. It's called The Shack. We've put out, uh, I think we're in the episode maybe 25 or so. And uh, it's one of those things we don't really necessarily talk about knives all the time. Guns, pocket dumps, uh, coolest truck we ever built. You know, just guys. Well, what it is, is the guys at the shop, when we get done with one of our, you know, cycles or something, we sit around and spend an hour talking to each other on audio and people like listening to it so we put it out as a podcast kind of thing so we have fun with that and then we do have guests from now and then, you know now and then come on uh so you can find us there uh, we do get out to events you can see check us out at the blade show that again we haven't been doing a lot of events lately we will be in georgia for uh that we'll be at smoky mountain for the meet and greet i think you'll, you'll probably we'll be there, there. Yeah, that's third weekend, October. Yeah, it's uh, they used to call it Rep Weekend, but it's a big yeah. deal at uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works. Uh, if you've never been, if you want to be completely overwhelmed by knives, yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is the place to do it. And what a bunch of great guys and, and that the whole company, too, to hang out with. Mm -hmm. Great. So, guys, I, I'm, I was honored to be asked. I'm always happy to talk knives and, and as i said uh, you know there's no secrets in knife making at least as far as i'm concerned so anyone can ask me anything and i can tell you where we get our stuff done or, or i can tell you all i know about the subject anyway and then it's on you from there but awesome for us. oh thanks for thanks for joining us i actually already ordered a genesis by the way too so oh well you should have said <laughs> no it's it's yeah i uh looked through it and then uh, so i Prior to you coming on, I checked out the site and looked at all the knives. And then when you told me what the flagship was, it's like, okay, that's the one I'm getting. Good choice. Good choice. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm a big, big fan of seeing stuff for myself. And so that's where that comes in. And especially, I, and I don't have any, several of these knives I absolutely have connections to, kind of like what, well, what you were saying, Shane. But and now this is, this purpose built, this can be my, this is my, my go-to. Be a nice change to have wonderful discussion wonderful discussion i suspect I'll, i'm going to get some feedback and people are going to have some questions and we may do a sequel to it i don't know um we are still going to be doing additional uh episodes talking about basically the the three second rules or no the the, the yeah no the Rule rules three. of three rules of threes are coming up uh continuing on the the outdoor survival stuff uh, next up is shelter and clothing, if I remember. I think and that so. one, yeah, we're still working on that. I uh, have a couple additional people that are going to jump on. Uh, what else? Next week, we're going to, we, man, we have an all star cast. We're going to be talking about the concept of the death of the gunfighter. And that might not be the final title of it, but essentially, with so many agencies, municipalities, cities, and all this, wanting these teddy bears as cops. And then when something bad happens, they wind up having teddy bears uh, and some agencies saying or cities saying, hey, we don't want your we don't want our officers to be trained to be warriors. OK, so I have some veterans, some known people. Um, I, I'm hoping that we're able to, I think we have Ed Morales, the famed M, uh, Ed Morales from uh, the FBI shootout. And I believe it was 1986, oh. basically. 
Yeah, big uh, changed uh, law enforcement big time after that occurred. Um, have some other notable people, uh, Mark Fricke, uh, hopefully Daryl Bolke, Chuck Haggard, and some other really just solid guys. And it's going to be a good discussion. I'm look, really looking forward to it. Um, if you like what you had, if you like what you heard, if you like the guys that were on the panel, make sure you find them. Support those support. No, again, I can't talk. Support those sources that you have found to be beneficial. Find them on social media. That's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you name it, all those places. Give them likes, give them subscriptions, share when it's beneficial to you. A uh, big thanks to our sponsors. Big thank you to Big Tech's Ordnance. Filster, Primary Arms, Walther, and our Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. Uh, it starts at $1 a month all the way to $100 a month. And there are benefits with each level. Uh, right now, we have a big video shoot that we're planning out. Actually, it's pretty much planned out. The video shoot's going to be uh, early September up here in Logan, up in uh, Utah. And... I have all this ammo. I have all these guns and we need to shoot them. And I only have two trigger fingers. So I need my Patreon subscribers to come out and visit. And then you get to shoot all the ammo you paid for. Uh, we're going to be doing some comparisons. We're going to be doing uh, one of the comparisons, which is, I think is going to be very interesting comparing a 10 millimeter to a 44 to a 357. And okay. So if I can shoot a 44 one round a second, but I can shoot 1.5 or two or three rounds of 10 in a second. And all of these have sufficient penetration against oh, predatory animals. What makes more sense for me to carry defensively? So that's, that's something that's actually been in the back of my mind for a while. So we're going to put it to the test and we have multiple shooters of multiple skill sets uh, and multiple guns to try this out and a lot of Buffalo bore ammo. So one of the things, one of the nice things also about having a lot of shooters for this um, I will not get carpal tunnel because everyone can share the same nerve, nerve damage. So that's going to be great. So I think that's pretty much it. You can find us at primary and secondary.com. We have a forum at primary and secondary.com slash forum, uh, 507, no, 736. That's usually the number I use 736 different Facebook groups. We are all over the place, YouTube, Instagram, all the audio podcast places. We're everywhere. So thanks for watching or listening, and we will talk to you guys later.